we are about eight to ten minutes behind, but we're trying to talk slowly this morning so we can <laughs> stretch the time. Um, we have the supervisor of elections, tax collector, uh, sheriff's office, and we have some other things to deal with. But um, the sheriff uh, has called and said that uh, probably would be here about 1130-ish. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll, 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 if we get to a point where we're, you know, out of things to do, Charlie's offered to dance and sing if we need it. Um, but uh, if we don't do that, <laughs> pray that we don't, um, then we may just take a break if we get to everything. But uh, so we'll see how things go this morning. Uh, Barry, let's go ahead and get started. Um, great. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, this morning, obviously, you just, as you just said, we have um, um, four um, areas to cover in terms of our budget. Uh, this is our last of our budget information sessions um, prior to us uh, kind of wrapping up the budget and bringing it back next month. Um, for our budget recommendation. Um, first up, we have the Supervisor of Elections, uh, Julie Marcus. Welcome, Julie. Well, good morning, everyone. Never sat down in a budget presentation before, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right, well, good morning again, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners, where's Barry, our County Administrator, Jewel White, County Attorney. Thanks for having me here today to present my proposed Fiscal 2022, it's hard to say 2022, I'm still stuck on 2020, uh, So, but I, I will do everything I can to refer to it as 2022. So the, my proposed budget is gonna provide us what we need uh, to support our core values. And our core values are transparency, integrity, and access, and to meet the needs of our voters and of course meet legislative requirements. Currently, we're working on some major projects, and we have others that we're preparing for so that we're ready for the midterm election cycle. We know that post-election manual audit, which is required by Florida law, have, that have to be done after every election, have done a lot for transparency. And to expand on this, beginning with the August St. Petersburg primary election, we will be conducting 100% audits of all precincts and all contests using a new system called Clear Ballot that you all approved funding for earlier this year. Clear Ballot is separate from the tabulation system. Every ballot that is tabulated, the Clear Ballot system will then separately inventory those ballots and tally those ballots and votes. The clear ballot vote totals are then compared to the tabulation system totals to ensure that the security and the accuracy of our ESNS tabulation system is correct. Not only does clear ballot audit each contest and each vote cast, it will be able to be used for recounts as soon as the Department of State completes the rulemaking process. And we have the election code, which is 97 through 106, but anywhere <coughs> within Florida statute where it provides for um, rulemaking authority, the Department of State has to create those rules, which are an extension of law in order for us to, to do that task, which would be the recount. So not only does clear um, ballot audit, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm. Anyway, that's, that's clear ballot. So we'll be using that in August for audits, and then we have to wait for the recount process. Operating and maintaining this system throughout the year is now a part of our physical and cybersecurity apparatus. Of course, anything involving security and technology requires expertise, which is why we have included in our proposed budget another exempt position in our IT department. Many of us have been together long enough to watch our understanding of cybersecurity evolve and the county's cybersecurity posture mature. And Jeff Roars, I don't see, but Jeff Roars and the folks at BTS deserve a lot of credit. And they really have gone above and beyond by collaborating with our, our office to secure the vote. We've acquired most of our physical and cybersecurity equipment to do this 
by using federal and state grant funds. Unfortunately, those funds have run out, and to keep up these systems moving forward, we are now going to have to make them a part of our county budget. Another hit, our federal activities grants that have been used, um, issued by the state have run out. And these funds were used for our legally required advertisements, for poll worker training, and now also have to be a part of our county budget. And after all of this <laughs> and our fall elections, the legislature will be meeting again, conducting redistricting, as this board will, and the school board. And once we receive district lines, we will begin drawing, redrawing precinct lines. So it is the legislative bodies of the state, the county, and school board to redraw districts because of reapportionment, but then our responsibility is then to create these uh, political jurisdictions called precincts, and then we have to renumber them, and then we have to get them approved by the Board of County Commission, this board, and we need to do all of this, and then ma and mail voter info cards before we mail ballots to voters for the August primary of 2022. We, of course, will work with Jewel and County Admin to make sure that you have all the information that you need timely. Um, and we will also be working with you all to make sure we get on the board's agendas appropriately so that we can meet all the legal requirements. I am going to do everything I can to make sure that we maintain the continuity of our precincts and our polling places everywhere we can. Why is that important? Because familiarity is essential to the electoral process. Voters who are familiar with the process are going to be more confident in that process. And voters who are more confident in a process are more likely to participate in that process. And that is my goal every single day. I also want to maintain that very delicate balance between access and integrity. So we have to be very deliberate and thoughtful in everything that we do. After every election, after every legislative session, we reevaluate our processes and our procedures. We look at data, we look at trends, we look at new requirements, and then we make evidence-based decisions that are responsive, responsive to our electorate. If you were watching the clocks on election night, you would have seen that 82% of election results in Pinellas were released by 7.05 p.m., with 100% reporting by 8.15 p.m. We have seen an increase in the number of voters voting prior to Election Day, reaching record numbers in 2020. With our continued efforts to ensure voters are educated about their voting options, we expect this trend to continue. For Pinellas voters, mail ballots have been the preferred method for casting ballots. Mail ballots are convenient, they are secure, and they are reasonable. Right now, more than 367,000 people, voters, or 52% of our registered voters, have a mail ballot request on file. And to continue to meet the needs of these mail ballot voters, our budget has to include um, return postage, and the costs associated with maintaining 25 mail ballot drop-off locations that are throughout the county. We have also followed in-person early voting trends. And what we saw in 2020 was a significant increase in the number of voters voting early. 
There is a point of diminishing returns on the number of early voting sites. However, the data supports adding two more sites to meet the needs of those voters choosing to vote early. It is in very important to note that just because you add a site or you move an early voting site does not mean you are making it easier or faster for voters to vote. For example, if you have a small facility that does not accommodate a large group of people, all you're doing is creating lines and wait times. So there is a lot of considerations that go into the number of sites and where those sites need to be located. For now, we are considering the new locations to be in the countryside area and in the Tyrone Lelman area. We are also considering relocating the early voting site that we had in 2020 at the Allstate Center to another location nearby. The list of considerations that we use to evaluate each of these spaces is extensive. For example, you have to take into consideration what the law requires for an early voting site. We have to make sure that they are equally accessible to all voters in the county. We have to consider things like mass transit. We have to consider ingress and egress, and that's with like does it make sense the way that cars are pulling in and traffic parking and the way that cars are going out? Does it make sense where voters are coming in and voting and are they easily able to get back out? Then you have ballot drop-off locations that have to be at those like locations. So there's a lot that goes into it. But going into 2022, 91% of all of the voters in Pinellas County will be within five miles of an early voting site, coupled with all voters being within three miles of a ballot drop-off location. Early voting, of course, has infrastructure costs. For example, we will have to buy ballot on demand printers and elect electric, ugh, try that again, electronic poll books. And this budget's going to allow for us to purchase that equipment that we need to stand up these additional sites. Knowing that the majority of the election is actually happening prior to election day, we need to add three more classified positions to our voter services department. It's just one of these things where we have the responsibilities have are to such a degree that we have to have people on staff that know what they're doing. Elections are very complex, um, and we have to have people with institutional knowledge. You can't just throw somebody in the middle of an election and be like, good luck. Uh, so we, I've, I've told every new employee who comes on board that your learning curve is solid four years because a municipal election is not a gubernatorial election. And a presidential, is in its own league. <laughs> so to that end, I have an incredible staff. And it really is difficult to put into words what these folks do and the sacrifices that they make to make sure that our elections are conducted fairly, accurately, and securely. And I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to the hundreds of additional county employees who helped us during the 2020 election cycle. Ken Burke, the clerk of the circuit court and comptroller, provided us with 50 employees who from July through the end of November helped us with everything from call center operations, from scanning and indexing, to mailing out ballots, to helping us process ballots, it goes on and on. Barry? Jill Silverboard, thank you. Your you all, your department heads, what you were able to do to help us get hundreds of county employees to be poll workers for every election during a pandemic, I really thank you. And Jewel White and your staff who help us in so many ways. I mean, litigation, that's a given legal counsel, but then our litany of questions to make sure we get it right. Because in elections, if you've 
as if you're canvassing board, as you know, there are no mulligans in elections. It has to be done right. You get one chance. And Jewel, you help to that, to, you help us in so many ways. And you help us with the canvassing board, of course, and make sure that we all stay on track. And that's hours and hours of support, day in and day out, so thank you. I am truly blessed to be a part of an amazing group of civil, civil and public servants. Pinellas is one of those large counties, but has that heart of a small town USA. We care about each other and we help each other. And in closing, I want to thank you for your time and your continued support. And of course, I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Okay, well, that was awesome. Thank you for that information. Thank you for your passion for what you do. And thank you for Pinellas County really being a leader, um, not only in the state of Florida, but throughout the country and what we provide our residents in terms of access and integrity. So um, great work. Um, questions, uh, Commissioner Flowers. Good morning. Um, good to see you. Julie started at the SOE office when I first started my career, I guess, in election, elected office. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of grown up in this together. Yeah, yeah. I think you're doing a really good job. And um, you know how I feel about you and your team. When I walk in the door, everybody knows my name. That's not to say they don't know everybody else's name, but mm -hmm. it's just like a little family over there. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you talk about being very deliberate regarding um, the way that you will look at uh, precincts mm -hmm. because you already know how many people may be confused yeah. as it relates to what precinct they have to go uh, to vote in. And so I really appreciate that. And more so because we have over 800 units being built right now between 38th Avenue South and 34th Street and about 22nd Avenue South. And so um, I participated in an event where we tried to drive people for uh, the Allstate Center to, to mm -hmm. make sure that they knew that place was present and that it was available. We had an activity. Thank you so much for partnering with us. And it was it was wonderful. I just I know you said you're going to look at moving that somewhere else. I just want you to maybe consider keeping it within that close proximity yeah. because with over 800 units being built, they will be completed soon. Yeah. Um, those persons are new added voters, you know, mm -hmm. to the area. And it's within walking distance mm -hmm. from the housing complexes down uh, mm -hmm. 38th Avenue South. So it's a wonderful location. And I just wanted to A, thank you all for adding that Allstate location and B, uh, considering to keep it in that area. Um, for your mail ballot requests, mm -hmm. um, you know, what all happened with the changes in legislation. Um, but I, I think we're going to see that increase, mail ballot request. Um, and so is there any additional communication or marketing that may be done related to signature verification? Um, because we do have some seniors who, or persons who are ill, you know, their signature may change because maybe they weren't on medication before, but they're on medication now, so mm -hmm. the signature isn't the same. Maybe they didn't know they should go in. That's not on the top priority list, unfortunately, to go in and maybe redo their signature. So do you have any plans for maybe just going forward to try to really get that information out so that mail ballot signatures mm -hmm. will match what you have on file? Yes. So we approach every year, no less election cycle, with an education program that is very comprehensive. So we take a layered approach to each way that a voter may want to participate in elections, starting with mail ballots, for example. How do you request a mail ballot? Uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that you keep your information up to date with us, whether that is, as you said, a signature, address, name, what have you? Because any time that you have a delay because an address wasn't updated, we can't get that ballot because ballots, there's a lot of information out there that is not necessarily um, accurate. For example, we don't just mail ballots to everyone. We right. never have. That has right. never been something in the state of Florida that has ever happened, ever. Right. And you have to request a mail ballot. Right. And if you don't keep your address current with us, 
then your ballot's not forwardable. It has to come back to us. So it's important for us to make sure that voters are educated on that. Same with signatures. Anytime that we find that signatures have reached a certain time, we, we send a letter to get an updated signature. Anytime a signature goes before a canvassing board, uh, whether it's accepted or rejected, but we follow up with those voters. There's also a cure process. Right. So mail ballots, making sure that you return them timely. We, it, 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 was, it was a great community effort, uh, whether it was our office, the media, uh, campaigns, candidates, what have you, last year in 2020, where voters were being educated on the process, which is, of course, helpful, because any time that we get folks to spread the word accurately about what the law is, uh, we saw a uh, we saw ballots coming in on time. Voters were signing, but I think voters were taking uh, a level of personal ownership too, to a degree that we that we never seen before. In the sense that I, they think they really wanted to be engaged and involved. And then same with early voting, making sure you bring the type of ID you need, uh, you know where you're going, uh, that you know the times that it closes on Sundays. We will maintain the Sunday before uh, that it's returned postage. We also are having maintaining our 25 ballot drop-off locations, and those locations um, have always been staffed in Pinellas County. <laughs> Pinellas County has served, I would say, is the model for how ballot drop-off locations should be used. We've always had chain of custody procedures. We have always had reconciliation and auditing procedures. They have always been staffed. A mail ballot has never been kept overnight at any location. They have always been required to be brought back. So these are things that Pinellas County has been doing since we've been doing this since 2008, which is lo long before other counties were doing them um, just as recently as last year. So I feel very confident in our procedures and have and moving forward. And as far as the voters concern, our goal is to ensure that it doesn't matter what we had to do to make it get ready for the election. I want every voter to have a positive voting experience and that they hit that that was easy button so that they come back and they vote again. So it doesn't matter what we have to do to get ready. I want to make sure the voters know, see it as something that was seamless and that they'll come back and vote. Um, and then election day, to speak on election day, Again, back in 2012 when we did redistricting then, it was also our goal. I think it was over 80% of our polling places never changed. Uh, and same with the precincts themselves. I mean, keep in mind, there's, there's there, to an extent, there's some things we're gonna have to. I mean, if district lines change, mm -hmm. a, a precinct is a, is a political jurisdiction where it has the same congressional, same House, same Senate, mm -hmm. same DCC, same school board. So you have all those layers, and then you have to start breaking up the county into precincts. So we're gonna do everything we can, maintain, we had 166 polling places in the 2020 general. I recognize that those community-based polling places are, are instrumental to the process because not everybody wants to vote by mail, that's fine. Not everybody can get to an early voting location, great, but they can walk to their polling place. Correct. So I think that having uh, a layered approach to an election is um, prudent. Thank you, and my last um, question is, um, since August isn't that far away, um, mm -hmm. will you be doing some type of communication related to masks coming in or not? Um, mm -hmm. Because you know we know that what's been stated statewide, but you still will have some people who are apprehensive. And I don't want to talk anything into negative existence, but unfortunately we've read cases of where persons have, um, they've been asked to put a mask on and, mm -hmm. and they've not, and it has caused some issues. So are you going to do anything just to kind of get that information out so that persons will know what their options are? so that people feel safe no matter which side you're on as it relates to wearing a mask or not. Mm -hmm. Our approach in 2020 will be no different going into this election cycle or 2022. We'll follow CDC guidelines. Uh, voters can choose uh, the way that they would like to particip participate in the election. So we'll have masks available if a voter forgot and they choose to do that. Um, but that would not be a requirement to vote. And it was not in 2020. 
Uh, yeah, just before you leave the com comment, could you just talk about the cure process mm -hmm. for signature a little bit? Because a couple of years ago, state made a change so that if we get a ballot early in the process that there's not a match, then we not only would we want to, but we also required to go back. So maybe talk just briefly about that curing yeah. process because it's important. Yeah. This is one of these, uh, I embrace legislative changes. So this was a wonderful opportunity given to our voters who may have just simply made a mistake. So you have um, two categories uh, mainly that are, are, in the, are in this cure uh, environment. One is you forgot to sign it. And the other is that there's a signature variation. So what happens is when a ballot is returned, it, it goes through our Blue Crest mailing system on the back end, it's called a sorter. It goes, all those ballots get through, put through there. They're then uh, identified as returned. Therefore, a voter couldn't return a second ballot. Uh, they couldn't show up at the polls on early voting or on election day and try to vote because it would show that they already voted. But this system also takes a picture of the envelope where the voter signed. So what happens is those ballots can then go into a ballot locker and then we can verify signatures using computer monitors. So I've got a picture of your signature that's in the file, and now I have an image of what was returned on the return envelope, and I can compare. Any signature that may not be, that it, it, that's a lot off, okay? So we're not talking, so I signed my name Julie with a K, Marcus. If I signed it Julie Marcus and left out the K, if you see the, the similarities between the J and the M and so on and so forth, that's, that's a comparable signature. We're talking, I sign my name in the file, but I, I, um, I wrote out, not cursive, and that's a signature differ. That's not the same. And so what happens, that would then get kicked out and we are required by law, which I think is great, to send that voter a letter with um, return postage envelope with instructions on how to cure that, which is an affidavit. They have to include a form of um, a, a copy of a form of ID. And if they send that back to us, we also make phone calls. We text if we can, we email if we can. Again, that's just based on what the voter provides to us as part of their file. And if they cure it, we count it. And then any ballots that maybe uh, were half cured, and what I mean by this is a voter included the affidavit, but they didn't include the required um, copy of a type of ID or they didn't return anything, then those go back down to the canvassing board because only the canvassing board can reject a mail ballot. And none of those that are in the cure process can be considered for rejection until 5 p.m. the Thursday following the election. So there, I, because it's, a, it's basically due process, it's allowing for that voter to go through a process before their ballot could potentially be rejected. But it's, it is a great law, and we're talking, you know, there's sometimes 40 to 50 percent of the ballots that end up in this category end up getting cured, where maybe five, six years ago, I think it was, would have been um, rejected otherwise. So that is a great law. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Um, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here. And uh, before I get my questions, just want to... Um, Thank you for representing Pinellas well in your advocacy and your communication with the state when they do these proposed changes and when they, the meeting that was the other day in Tampa. Um, anyway, just want to thank you for advocating for the voters of Pinellas. I appreciate that. Um, did I hear you say that you were going to put an early voting site in Tyrone? Yeah, so we're considering the Tyrone Lelman area, so somewhere in that area. We have a couple sites in mind, but um, yes. But I would like to note that we are moving um, your polling place to Tampa. Well, I was going to say that you, you must have lost, <laughs> I've sit here or, 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 or your predecessor's, your predecessor's <laughs> executive memo about no voting sites in Tyrone 
uh, must have gotten lost or expired somewhere along the way for that to happen. Well, <laughs> um, no, it's more. It's more in the. We're looking at between 22nd Avenue North and Lalment, which is like 54. It's, it's an, a location in between there. Okay. Again, there's the building has to make sense. So somebody may say, well, why didn't you just drop it in the middle of this community? Well, it may not have made sense for the reasons that I gave during the presentation. And believe it or not, ingress and egress, how cars move in and out and traffic and, you know, the, the, some, somebody once said, why don't you use the clerk of the circuit courts building on US 19? I'm like, because who, how are you gonna get in and out of that? out of that building. <laughs> I'm like, US 19 and there's no, there's no turn, there's no, there, there isn't a light. So there's just things that we need to think of because the last thing we want our voters to do is show up at an early voting site, which by the way, the statute leads with, for the convenience of the voters. So we want to maintain that early voting is a convenience and not make folks stand in line for no reason. And then we have 301 precincts, correct? Yes. So. Before the pandemic, how many actual polling sites did we have on election day? And then how many did we have with the cutback last year with all the situation there? And then how many do you anticipate having for this fall in 2022? So we lost, we lost between um, the PPP, the, the March election of 2020 and the August primary, I think it was 12. A lot of those were assisted living facilities or facilities where it was 55 plus communities, which makes sense. But because we didn't want there to be an issue moving forward, we just chose not to stay at those locations. Uh, so in the 2020 general, we had 166. And again, going into redistricting, it, our goal is to stay as close to that number as possible. Okay, I would just, as you're looking at them to, um, and I know we joke a lot about my, my precinct, um, uh, but in reality, my precinct from when I moved into my house, which was six blocks, <laughs> six blocks from my house, to where it was 12 blocks from my house, to where now it's uh, 2.9 miles, and by Google, it's an hour, over an hour walk. So it, I know we have a lot of fun joking about it, but I want us to be cognizant that those are real issues that folks face that don't have the luxury or, or may not want to do by mail, may not want to do early voting, but still want, as long as we have it available in law, want that voting day experience, which I do. I love that. I love going on an election day, um, but that's, it's getting to be more of a thing. And I just, I want us to be cognizant at every step of the process. As much fun as we have with it, I want us to take it a little seriously too. I take it very seriously. And I feel very strongly that after our 2020 general election, where we had 79% highest voter turnout in decades, um, also highest voter turnout than the five largest counties in the state, us being the sixth. I feel that our voters did not experience wait times. I mean, that these are, this, these are statistics. Um, they had positive voting experience in unprecedented circumstances. So I feel, and I know that we joke around, um, but I feel that our voters are, have the opportunity to cast a ballot, whether they choose by mail, early voting, or on election day, and that we provide the best customer service that we can to ensure that our voters are treated fairly and that they can cast a ballot um, and feel that their voices were heard and that their votes were counted accurately and securely. Very good. Okay, Commissioner Gerard. Just a couple of questions. Thanks for being here. I'm really glad to hear you're adding the early voting sites. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Um, oh, the uh, mail ballot requests. We're going to have to do that for every election now, but does our little checkbox that we do, yeah. that serves as a request for the next one, right? Yeah, so. Or do we know that yet? <laughs> well, yeah, so we're still, we're still, Okay, so the law, the, the law that it has, has changed. So now it's instead of the uh, end of the calendar year of the second general election, it'll be the end of the calendar year of one general election cycle. So yes, requests will come off and we'll have, voters will have to put those back on. Our goal is to make that process seamless for the voters. Unfortunately, from the way that it looks after speaking with council, 
we are not going to be able to use that checkbox anymore because of the information that is now going to be required. But we will have a way that voters are going to be able to request mail ballots and be able to participate in the election if they choose to vote by mail. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is that I don't want to create a process where it's going to feel that voters have to go through a maze or that they have to follow, you know, all these different steps and procedures to, and that's complicated and trying to figure out how do I navigate this very complex process. No, we are going to craft a way that voters are going to, it's going to be right there. It's going to be like, oh, this is now how I have to do it and be able to get that request back in that makes sense and that also is cost effective. Um, and I think that we can do that. I feel very positive that we're going to be able to find to, that we're going to, we have a way that we're going to be able to do that. Okay, and after redistricting, you'll have to. Uh, will people have to request <laughs> register? I mean, there, if there are precinct changes, will you just send them a voting ID card, or if if it changes, but you don't have to send it to everyone. So for redistricting, we will have to send a voter information card. Right. I just want to say that because it's important, this changed many, many years ago. You cannot use this voter info card as a form of identification to be used at the polls. Basically, it's for informational purposes. It's to tell you, where you what your precinct number is, where your polling place is, and then the districts in which you're um, eligible to vote in. And every voter in 2022 is going to have to be mailed one of these vote um, these voter info cards, okay. regardless of the, their precinct or polling place changes, because the districts will have changed. So we'll have to update that across um, the bottom of the card. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? Just Sorry. so you know, commissioners. Um, the four positions that Julie talked about, those are within her budget target that she was provided by OMB, so she met that within her budget. And then there's also one decision package that's for scanning of historical voter re registration applications that we'll consider as part of the budget. Okay. She says that's boring, but anytime you're talking money, it's not boring. So. <laughs> no, but I, I, if I may, since it was brought up, just to quickly explain it. When it comes to voter registration applications pursuant to the public records law and retention law, they have to be kept forever. And we have voter registration applications that are in boxes up on the second floor that if we do not scan and index these documents, we, 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 are, we, are, we will lose the integrity of those documents and to make sure that we're in compliance with statute, we have put in the budget for us to be able to work with the clerk of the circuit court, whose staff would then um, index uh, and scan those, I'm sorry, scan them first, then and preserved and maintained so that we can meet the requirements under the statutes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Long. I wasn't gonna say, <coughs> excuse me, I wasn't gonna say anything, Julie, but your attention to detail and your way in which you have been so articulate this morning in explaining the massive amount of detail involved with putting on an election is remarkable. And I could not applaud you more for how you have filled very big yes, shoes that you were left and really pulled that off in a stellar professional, incredibly nonpartisan way, which in the world we live in today is remarkable all on its own. So I just wanted to share my heartfelt thanks for that as it relates to you. And also, um, you know, I ask this question of the supervisor of elections every single year because the first time I ever saw it, it so touched me that I want to make sure it continues for our mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to know if you're still delivering that magnificent little video about the dog tags mm -hmm. and the importance mm -hmm. of voting. Well, you're gonna start making me cry. I can't so. help it, it chokes me up every single time I 
think about it. Yeah, so we uh, actually, uh, we created the Vote in Honor of a Vet program, which received uh, national recognition. As it should have. And, you know, I come from a military family. My father served, my sister, and now my nephew is um, in the Air Force serving overseas. And um, not that this is, <laughs> this is a pretty good, um, pretty good uh, base, but he's in Italy, so good for, good for him. Good for so he him. made it to Italy. Um, he was quarantined forever while he was over there, but it took, a, but I'm, I'm very proud of him. I'm very proud of my family's service. But I think that, I think it's really important that we continue to know the sacrifices that, fo that men and women have made over, since the beginning, since we declared um, our independence. And um, it's, not just, it's not just limb, it's life. I mean, it's life. People died for what we have. And I think it's really important that we, we don't just do our vote in honor of a vet program in our high schools. We start in the elementary schools. I yeah. believe that civics is important. I believe that what we have here in this country is, is I mean, there are people who, there are people who die to try to go and vote today. And um, we are very blessed. And I think that it's very important that our, we go into elementary schools, middle schools, our high schools, our colleges, so that we conduct mock elections, which the kids love because they, you know, they get to vote on their, uh, you know, their class presidents, but they also get to vote on like what their favorite ice cream is. So it's basically it's just showing that, that you know from a young age that by the time they turn 18, it's like oh I know what this is, and they go and do it. It's it's familiar. It's something that they're used to seeing and doing, and I don't want it to be something that when they turn 18 that it seems so. Uh, like um, it, 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 that they they're not that they don't know what it is. So therefore, if I don't know what it is, I'm not going to do it. So, I'm really proud of our voter outreach program, and yes, that that the students recognize that my veteran because that's the base of the program is you're voting in honor of a veteran, and you get a veteran biography, and then, so then it makes it personal that I'm turning out to vote because of this veteran sacrifice, you get a dog tag that basically you promise to vote in honor of your veteran. And yes, that program will continue. Good. Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for asking about that and uh, sharing that story. I think that's a, just a great program. Awesome. Thank you. Well, the reason it was so meaningful to me, because at the same time that I saw that, both of my sons were serving in combat. Yes, so. I know. I remember and thank you, because I can't even fathom what that must be like for mothers and dads and husbands and wives and kids. But the most remarkable thing was watching the enthusiasm from the students when they got to elect in real life, you know, at a polling station, their class presidents and their mm -hmm. officers for each of the classes. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary, yeah. and I mean, I just found it, I don't know, it just very patriotic, so yes. thank you for that. Yeah. And whoever came up with that was a genius. <laughs> but I think in the world, well, I, we, <laughs> did you? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you, Dustin, because you know what? In the world we live in, as divisive as everything is, I think you should be showing that in the Congress, quite frankly. Yeah. It could make a huge difference. Yeah, I, I would like to think that we all st we are that our common thread is we're all Americans and we do have a great love for our country, and let's get out and vote. Let's do our part. I think it's really. I mean, obviously, I mean, our, our whole staff, every one of us believes in what we do. You you bleed red, white, and blue. You have to. <laughs> People say, why do you do this? And I'm like, because the room next door is padded. So I have a pattern, you know, but that joke, all joking aside. But no, I mean, you, you really have to love what you do. I mean, folks who come on board, they're either there for a very short period of time or they're lifers. And, uh, and we have a lot of people who have been doing this for, uh, well, it's for a very long to time. I'm so, here today. I hardly recognize Yes, if I can, I'd like to. Yes, 
If I, yeah, he looks very distinguished today. He sure yes. does. So that's Dustin Chase. <laughs> Dustin Chase is my um, deputy supervisor of elections slash communications director. My chief deputy, Mark Gillette, is in Orlando in a voter focus. Uh, our voter registration uh, database is uh, our vendor that we use is VR and they're having a round table. So we kind of had a split um, responsibility. So him and staff that are involved in making sure that um, our processes work properly are over there at a round table. And Dustin had the luxury of um, making sure that this went well. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Good job, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions for Julie? Okay, Julie, thank you. Thank you all yeah, very much right. for your time. Appreciate it. Commissioners, next up we have the tax collector, Carlos Thomas. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hi there. Well. Uh, turn that speaker on. There you go. We'll hear you better. There you go. Now I'll bet you home we fine. Yeah. <laughs> morning, Mr. Eggers, uh, Vice Chair. Justice, members of the board, County Administrator Burton, and of course, Jewel, our county attorney. It's great to be here, folks. I am not the eloquent speaker that our supervisor <laughs> of elections is, but I do share a passion for serving our community and serving the citizens of Pinellas County that I know everyone in this room shares. And we have, um, taken very seriously, as I know everyone in this room does, the responsibility and stewardship of the public purse and making sure that we spend and what we spend, we spend wisely. And so we uh, created a budget that I feel confident meets the statutory requirements of being neither insufficient nor excessive in order to carry out the duties and responsibilities of the Office of Tax Collector. And this year's budget is um, 4.2% above the fiscal year 21 adopted budget and um, a little less than the inflationary increase expected. So we feel pretty good that the budget is is appropriate, it's uh, good stewardship of public spending, and will meet the mission. I'm very happy to say that I've, uh, I have the pleasure of leading a group of people that are truly dedicated public servants. They're dedicated to our values of community, service, and respect, and they work really hard every day to serve the citizens of this county and, and do an extremely uh, good job of doing that. While I'm here, I'd also like to thank uh, the board for your support in getting our new South County office uh, opened last August. It, um, it was a long time coming. Couldn't have done that without you. And we really feel like we're able to up the level of service in the south part of the county, in the St. Petersburg area to our citizens there. Uh, staff loves the new building. Our customers seem to really like it. It was designed well in order to provide personal security for our customers' private information. It offers a full array of services, including an on-range driving course. And next week, I'm happy to tell you that we will be opening a concealed weapons licensing processing office in that office. Uh, it's slated to be a soft open on the 23rd. We will begin setting appointments the 1st of July. We'd like to make sure that the equipment comes up as expected uh, before we, we do a hard open, but uh, we're really excited about that. With that additional capacity, I feel really good about us being able to meet uh, customer demand for those services. And now folks from the south end of the county won't have to drive all the way to the north end of the county to uh, process a concealed weapon license. Um, the other thing I'd like to let you know is that uh, as of uh, the last couple of, actually the last couple of months, 
we've experienced some service level disruptions that are due to the state's um, implementation of a new driver's license system. It's called Orion. And, and Orion has its uh, rollout uh, challenges like, like any application. Uh, and, and you need to go through bug fixes and tweaks to make the product a little bit better. What we're experiencing now is a little different than that, though. The actual environment in which the application resides in Tallahassee is a bit unstable. But the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles has gotten the budget they need to create a new environment to host that application. And over what I'm hoping will be just the next few weeks, we'll be able to get that new environment set up, have the driver's license application moved into that new stable environment, and we'll, we'll see far less of the disruptions to service we see. It's upsetting to both customers and staff not to be able to get the, um, the appointment completed that, that you set in, and came to the office to have done. So that's pretty much uh, my uh, discussion for you all. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try and answer them for you. Commissioner Seal. Can you explain more um, about the custom services agreement and the increase in personnel? Is everybody doing that? All the constitutional officers? No, this, this is a change. So he shifted four positions from uh, BTS uh, that, was per, per, that was being provided by BTS um, into his office. So that's what yes, you're asking um, about. What we've done is we're bringing back in-house the help desk functions from BTS. So, so what, about four years ago, we outsourced both infrastructure support and help desk to BTS. Um, over the last few years, we found is that the uh, infrastructure support, housing the, the servers um, and providing for uh, security patches and things of that nature, those are still good resigning with BTS. But both Jeff Roars and myself and staff have come to an agreement that they're not the best providers of help, help desk services. What we really need is people that are more in tune with and knowledgeable about our specific duties and responsibilities in order to really do that well. So we agreed to take that back in-house, uh, re uh, had to put those positions back in the budget, and, um, and then the uh, BTS will no longer provide help desk services for us. And so you'll see a shifting so from BTS, and I, I know staff's been working on that. I, I don't know that we've resolved it. I'm sure Jeff wants to keep the positions, but uh, um, we, we'll look to reduce those positions, so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to hear, I guess, that one more sentence of detail about, you were talking about the driver's license system in Tallahassee being unstable. In the, uh, in the, in the world the, of cyber stuff right now, unstable scares the heck out of me. So I just, uh, if you wanted to explain it, it a little bit more, I guess. It, it's, a, it's a little, it's a little nerve wracking for us as well. <laughs> I, I, I've not, in fact, last week I uh, had a uh, teleconference meeting with the entire Florida Tax Collector Association and the, uh, the head of the uh, data center for DHSMV. And, and they weren't really talking about the system uh, being vulnerable to outside hacking. It's just the, uh, the system is old and it's having a difficult time uh, maintaining um, itself with an environment now that you have a much more robust system. Orion is a very robust system and in the long run is going to be a far better driver's license system. But it's more robust. Demand is greater than it was 20 years ago when the uh, prior application was set up. And uh, a new environment is being built to address that. So uh, we were never told that it, it was vulnerable in the areas of cybersecurity. And, and that would be a genuine concern for all of us. But more one of not the uh, capacity to handle the volume. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you, Carlos, and thank you for bringing that up about the, the system. You know, it occurs to me that there might be an opportunity here 
for us all collectively when we put our legislative packages together next year um, to request a more thorough examination of all of the state's computer systems wherein they support a lot of these activities within our own separate counties. And the reason I say that is because it certainly isn't a secret how unbelievably antiquated the system is as it related to our unemployment compensation claims. And again, that was harking back to their quote unquote computer system. And just as you just mentioned, Carlos, about the, how old the system was, I think the whole damn thing is an ancient, and we're in the 21st century now. Things are moving at light speed faster than ever before. I do sit on our BTS board, and Barry knows from a finance, financial perspective, it's impossible almost to keep up with how expensive it is to have the newest and the greatest and the most up-to-date softwares and technologies to keep from being vulnerable to cybersecurity. So I think, you know, there's strength in numbers, and if we all got on that bandwagon requesting some kind of update to those different systems that affect all of us, oh, and by the way, our budgets, which ultimately affect our taxpayers, I can't help but think that we get somebody's attention that's a great point, Commissioner Long. Um, it was, it's something that kind of uh, reminds me of what you just said. I, I was having a discussion with my uh, chief technology officer the other day, and we were talking about how you can get thumb drives now for $150 at hit will store four terabytes of data. I can remember back in the <laughs> early 2000s when BTS bought their first terabyte hard drive. And we're talking about a system that's, that's housed, that was built and housed in a uh, environment that was built a long time ago. Now, about 10 years ago, the uh, Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles moved their data center from the Neil Kirkman building in Tallahassee, which is where DHSMB is housed, to the uh, state's Digital Technology Services office. This new environment will be kind of going back in the other direction. It will be an independent environment built to house uh, the Florida driver's license and Florida real-time vehicle information systems. So, and, and you've seen kind of some ebb and flow of those things over the years as we go from, it's better to be decentralized to centralized. Now we seem to be making a move back to maybe decentralized is a little better. And those security issues I think are at the forefront of those discussions. Good. Yeah, I, I Any other, uh, Commissioner Flowers? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, for um, your uh, time and attention to matters, especially during COVID. I had a chance to attend the office and the way that persons were able to get in through appointment processes was very delightful. I also want to applaud um, Mr. Thomas for assisting me. Um, I called him because a lot of uh, persons in South St. Pete were very disappointed when the office on 62nd Avenue South was being closed. Um, some of the senior residents that live in that area with them trying to get up to the 22nd Avenue, 34th Street uh, location to, to handle their business. and. Um, so there's a kiosk in Publix on 54th Avenue South and 34th Street that persons can use and do and take care of some of those issues. Um, and so I want to thank you for that because that really helps. Um, I did ask him if he would take a look at the traffic and the ebb and flows of persons coming through the new office um, to see where it lands when it comes to who's util utilizing that facility. Um, and maybe there's an opportunity later down the road for us to readdress that concern if there is still a concern, if, if things don't work. So I want to thank you for that. I would have to say also that um, based on what we talk about in BTS and based on cybersecurity issues and concerns, I am concerned that the system of the Orion system is, is kind of shaky. 
um, because I think we're doing everything we need to do on our end to secure systems. But if things happen further up the chain, we don't have you know, control over that. So um, I really appreciate you um, uh, keeping that um, in the forefront. Um, that's all I have for now. It doesn't seem like your requests are, you know, out of the norm. So, but I just wanted to make those uh, few uh, comments. Thank you, Commissioner Flowers. Appreciate your kind words. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioners, if we can, uh, the sheriff said he'll be here approximately 1130. So, um, we can move to the Board of Commissioners um, budget. Uh, Cecilia, if you can cover that. Good morning. I'm Good morning. Cecilia McCorkle from OMB. I'm going to present the Board of County Commissioners district budgets to you today. Um, for your granted asylum, it's the first attachment, just to orient you to that. You'll see on the first page, I'll go ahead and start with the staffing summary. As you see, there is no increase to FTE or change at all from FY21 for uh, the Board of County Commissioners. It's uh, been steady at 15 for several years. That change from 18 to 19, if you recall, was when a long-term temporary de uh, front desk employee was converted to a full-time county employee. Um, with your budget summary, you'll see overall the districts combined uh, increased by 2.4%. Um, the major contributors to that are the personal services increase, which increase, uh, include pay adjustments for staff, as well as we factor in a 2% 2, 2 increase for the commissioner salaries. It's truly unknown at this time what those will end up being next year. We usually find out in the September time frame, which is a little late to work them into the budget, so we try to average out a few years and come up with a reasonable assumption for that. So um, that's why you'll see a, an increase there. If you recall last year, we created one shared cost center, which you won't see segregated on this report, but I just wanted to remind you with that change for FY21, we shifted all the personal services costs into one cost center, as well as a lot of the shared costs that um, are, are used among all the districts, such as some of the copier repair and maintenance, um, the, um, excuse me, the events budget that we added and uh, your risk allocations that you have that are uh, come from our risk cost plan, as well as your computer replacements. And that's what you'll see in the capital outlay line, that's 16999. Um, that is your, your computer replacements for FY22, and those are cyclical. They come every three years according to the BTS co uh, re computer replacement plan. And just for on the events budget for Commissioner Flowers, that that's so uh, you go through the chair's office for, um, you know, events that that they, you may want to buy a table at or things like that. And um, the, the chair, they set that up a few years ago. Okay. Uh, each of the individual districts were provided a budget target, increasing the um, current year FY21 budget by 2.3%, which you've heard consistently throughout our presentations. Um, all of the districts stayed within that target. Two districts came in lower than that. Um, District 4 and District 5 came in below target. And like I said, the rest of the districts would map their targets. And that's really all I have, unless you have any further comments. Any questions, comments about our budget? And uh, just I was going to mention it on, on Tuesday, but we, we have um, also, yeah, through the process, um, uh, replaced our executive assistant position. We've gone through that process the last couple of months, and uh, our new executive assistant, Nikki Coates, will be joining us, I think, Monday, right? That's her first day. Um, so she'll, she'll be taking over that full time. Um, and I, you know, really wanted to thank um, Stacy, uh, who is going to be um, Pat Gerard's assistant, and um, and and Jan uh, from Commissioner Seal's office for really stepping up during these last couple of months to help out because there's just been so much um, change and effort in trying to get the new position advertised and, um, and Commissioner Justice and uh, Courtney for helping with the interview process. It, you know, again, we don't do it that often, so when we go through that process, it's a, 
it's a little cumbersome, but I think we have a we've gotten a really good person to come in, and I think she'll she brings a lot of energy and a lot of experience, and I think will be a big assistance to the floor, um, and a great attitude. So. It's not an, ad, an added position, of course. It's just an, a new person coming in there. So any questions about our, our budget? Um, and before I forget again, I just wanted to say that Commissioner Peters is not here. She had a, a, some, a medical issue this morning and couldn't make it, and so she's dealing with that. So I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. Um, okay, so we have some time um, to uh, discuss a few items. Um, one of the things that we were going to discuss on Tuesday, which we, I guess we could discuss today, uh, remember a month or two ago we decided that we would stay um, here for our commission meetings through the end of July, but that at the end of June we would discuss whether we wanted to come back to the chambers in August. And that's what I was going to bring up for discussion. Um, the plan was let's move, let's move our uh, co commission meetings back to Court Street um, for the first meeting in August. The workshops are, would, at this point, uh, in, I think would be here. I know Barry's looking at an alternative for that, um, mm -hmm. and we'll see what the costs of doing that alternative uh, there is. But I know you're going through that process. One of the pushes is to try to make sure that we have a better um, I, I, I like a roundtable discussion opportunity for workshops um, and still be televised so that our residents can see what's going on. So mm -hmm. that's the effort that's underway, and um, we'll see what that comes in at. Otherwise, we can stay here for our workshops, whatever. We're in that process of moving ourselves back there. This facility, I think Barry's plan right now is to keep stay open through the end of the calendar year, Barry? Or, Correct. Okay. Yes, there's, there's a lot of... A group, different groups that use that and as you know even down on the fifth floor it gets very tight for TDC and some of the others so we need to work with them see what their you know comfort level is um, with that but if we can if if um, if you want to move back for our BCC meetings we're working on a plan Kevin gave me a, you know preliminary numbers this morning he wants to make sure that's an all-in cost um, so we want to confirm that before we say we're ready to go. But that's somewhere we could create adequate meeting space at a reasonable cost that would be down at the communications um, building. Um, that way it would be accessible to our offices and staff and things like that. Um, so we're working on that. We could have that ready by the end of the year if, if, um, in fact, okay. if that if we comes about. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, obviously the change is getting back to where we belong sooner rather than later, but I don't want it to be a confusing process for our residents to, like, where are we meeting for this meeting and where are, we, where are you all convening for another meeting? So um, but I just want to make sure everybody here is comfortable that we're going to move, the, the plan is to move back for our commission meetings to the chambers in August, first meeting in August, and that at this point we would continue to have our workshops here um, and then I, uh, I guess, like Barry said, the Tourist Development Council and um, our forward Pinellas group would have to make their own decisions about when they're ready to move back. I suspect forward Pinellas does not meet in August, so probably in September, but we'll have that discussion in the July meeting, I hope. So okay. give you some direction. Any thoughts, ideas? Commissioner Justice, did you have okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We had just, last time we talked about this, we talked about uh, at the dais only having the commissioners and having staff at the tables there just to spread out just a little bit to give a little bit more of that, you know, maybe four feet, three feet. Um, and we had a meeting, our Historic Preservation Board actually held a meeting in the assembly room last month. And, uh, and it, I can tell you it's a very different feel after we've had this much room to be back in there. If you weren't claustrophobic before, <laughs> um, you might you might uh, feel that way after, but having just a seven instead of nine up at the dais really does give a little more space there, um, and um, as we make these decisions, I think we make assumptions about steps that we've all made to um, be safe, but I don't know that we can guarantee those assumptions are actual factual in our interpersonal uh, decisions. So. Um, I would prefer to have the, just a little bit of space at the dais there um, rather than having nine packed in there. My two cents. 
Any other <clears throat> any other thoughts? Um, well, you can imagine, if, or if you feel a little close for, with seven or nine people, that I think the TDC has over ten or eleven, and t maybe twelve, and then we have the MPO that has thirteen, not including the director. So, or the so we're gonna, you know, it's a little different when you start talking about those groups. It's a little bit different, but I mean, clearly that's the direction that we're heading unless things globally or nationally or whatever change, I mean, I think that's the direction we ought to be heading in. So I hope to have those conversations next this month and next month with those two groups. But for, for our perspective, I think um, it sounds like we're comfortable moving back in August for our commission meetings. And um, uh, we'll take Commissioner Justice's thoughts about seven versus nine on the dais. Uh, into consideration, but I, d I do like having I do like having uh, the you guys at the at the dais if we can, but we'll see how that works out. Okay, Jim. All right. Um, yes, Commissioner Long. How long are we going to keep these things up between us? You tell us. Um, I mean, we can we can take them out. We can keep. Them. It's, it's really up to up to you. I don't like them. It's hard to see. Hmm. Well, this could be one of our toughest votes of the year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, they, at some angles, they get a little bit like at this angle. I can't Fuzzy. necessarily see, you know, Commissioner Seal that well. But I mean, if we're <laughs> To Commissioner Justice's comment, if we're going to get, ever get comfortable moving back to the dais at the courthouse, um, you know, first step would be probably getting rid of these so we can start to be more comfortable with it because it's going to be, it'll be a lot tighter there. I mean, we're not, you know. Maybe we could bring these back to the assembly room and put <laughs> oh, them in. come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you, if you there's some city halls where they put up spacing and you kind of like, Get in between your pet. I mean, yeah. You talk about claustrophobic. Yeah. They, some of these dioceses are really tight, and people yeah. have done that because they don't. They didn't have a room like this to go to, um, but it's really tight putting up pl plexiglass barriers on a dais type situation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not hearing a overwhelming support for removing them. It's just, it's just for another month. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we have a meeting coming up on Tuesday, and then next month we have a meeting and a workshop. So, All right, well, I think we probably will leave them just because of the other groups that are involved here as well. And I don't want to be up taking them out. And, and I haven't really had that discussion yet at the TDC or at the um, or forward Pinellas yet. So, um, I think we probably ought to leave them up for now. And then see how those things work out. If you don't uh, mind, Commissioner Long, too much, we'll suck it up for three more meetings here. Okay. And we'll sur we'll survey where the other um, organizations that use um, this, you know, as a meeting room. Yeah. There, there are. I mean, just so we we know this this room is used for a lot of different meetings. You know, employee groups, uh, different committees that you know, employee committees and and things like that. So. Um, you know, we're in dire need of, of meeting room space, and uh, this is one of the only large meeting rooms that we have, you know, anywhere in the county. So, um, you know, we can, you know, we'll work on these. We'll bring it back to you. We'll survey the other groups. But the idea then we'll go forward with August for the BCC meetings, and we'll continue to meet here for the workshops through the end of the year. Yeah, that would be the plan unless we hear differently. And, okay. And that works out, so, okay. And, and, and you, if I it, could offer one thing, I think another thing that we need to do is to take a look at any public hearings that may have been noticed and make sure that we haven't gone into August yet. Um, I wouldn't think so at this point in time, but to the extent that perhaps we have, if we still have time to re-advertise it for a new location. You know? So I think that's some information we, we need to gather on your zoning and land use cases, on any forward Pinellas cases. Um, vacations and the things that you would normally see on your public hearing agenda. So I think that's some information we need to gather up too. We'll, we'll check. Ford Pinellas will still be here, so um, but but we'll check. Yeah. Um, okay. 
But but I, I still think the direction would be to do that. So we just have to re re advertise, I guess, if we have to. Right. Yeah, and I think that we need to look at some of those. I hear Forward Pinellas um, would still be here, and I'm not exactly sure how they advertise those cases, but they may be advertising the county commission case at the same time, the Forward Pinellas cases. So we, we just need to check on some of those details. Uh, Della says she's been working with them, yeah. so. Yeah the, yeah, the plan had been to have that discussion today, so hopefully some of that was vetted already, but. We should be okay, but we'll, we'll confirm. Or Tuesday, okay. Um, and if we have to, Barry, we can, uh, if you can maybe check on that before Tuesday, and if we okay. have to make any adjustments. All right. We can do that. Okay. Any other questions on that front? Okay. Um, and then um, we sent a resolution around uh, regarding, uh, well, everybody read the, re uh, hopefully has had a chance to read the resolution. Um, and the two issues are, do you want to take that action today? This is. Um, St. Pete requested of the Florida Department of Transportation uh, the ability to light the causeway, or excuse me, the causeway, the Skyway Bridge, um, really for up to a week, but certainly inclusive of uh, June 28th. Um, and um, I think at the end of the at the end of the day, the the FDOT has said um, that um, it really needs the no objection letter or resolution from Hillsborough County, Manatee County, and Pinellas County. So, um, and, and when we say uh, no restrictions, they, that's the wording that St. Petersburg came up with. So um, they just want to make sure that we don't have any, that we don't object uh, to the, or we have no restrictions, if you will, on the lighting for the, uh, for the Skyway. Um, and, and so, uh, I think uh, we heard yesterday Manatee County at a workshop um, that offered no uh, restrictions or no objections to, to that. So here we are today. If we want to take action, uh, uh, Jewel, you said you're, speak to that item if you don't mind. Um, really, the, the, uh, the reason why you all don't take votes on work sessions, it's really your own policy not to do that. Um, I don't see a problem with voting on this type of resolution that doesn't have any kind of special notice requirement or anything of, of that nature. I know that there is um, a bit of a sense of urgency from the city just because of some of the moving pieces and the dialogue that's been had on this topic. Um, you know, that said, I feel like if the commission felt uncomfortable, it wouldn't be disastrous, perhaps, if you waited until Tuesday to yeah. adopt this. I, I, um, but, but I felt for an item like this, if you all chose to deviate from your normal policy and vote on this, it would be fine. Yeah, I, I, I did call the city of St. Petersburg and told them that worst case scenario for them would be that we would let them know on Tuesday. And, um, you know, again, I think the preference would have been today, but if Tuesday comes, that's fine. The 28th is actually a week from Monday. That's their, the day that's most important to them. And for a week leading up to and around that date, the 23rd works fine. So anyway, that's where we are. Commissioner Gerard. I'd just like to move that we approve the resolution of no objection. Okay. I, I, what are okay. we talking about? Excuse me? I was at oh. the, in the ladies' room. What a, the Skyway Bridge. Oh, lighting the Skyway yeah, Bridge. You, this resolution was put on your table. Oh, it also was sent to you, I think, last, yesterday. So um, by issuing the motion in the second, we're also saying in that motion that you're comfortable making the decision today. I just want to make sure everybody is. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions or all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We'll get that to um, under Barry's signature to FDOT and we'll yep. copy City of St. Petersburg so that they understand. Yep our decision. Okay, um, uh, it's now 11, and um, uh, the sheriff said probably 11.30, so mm -hmm. I think probably unless there's something else that uh, Barry or the commission wants to chat about, that we'll go ahead and take a break, um, come back 11.30, maybe quarter to 12. Um, uh. Oh, you already did OMB. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah we, we moved that up yesterday. So um, 
Anything for the good of the order? Okay, so we'll take a break till at least 11.30, um, maybe quarter to 12. Did you have something, Barbara? Okay. Uh, Barry, anything? No, I asked staff if there's anything that we could move off and talk about today, and okay. nobody's given me any ideas. That's so. certainly unusual that we can't <laughs> find anything to talk about. We tried to find some filler items, but um, yeah, the sheriff will be over here probably 11.30, he said, but you know, again, it's dependent upon how that meeting goes, so. Um, yeah. So, Commissioner Flowers, did you have? Yeah, no, I just, yeah, the only other thing I was going to mention, I, you know, I, I almost take for granted sometimes uh, my assistant and, um, uh, and Kim has just been amazing this year, but I just really wanted to thank her also for the effort to, to find um, our new executive assistant because in the middle of a lot of things that are going on and um, including the normal work of District 4, which is a lot of, you know, we have 120 to 130,000 unincorporated residents that, that we were, that, that we're their frontline government, if you will, us here. Um, so I just want to thank you publicly for the effort uh, to get all of that done in a timely uh, fashion and well done as well. So, um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Flowers. You had a comment or question? Um, I just, um, whenever we go back to the chambers, that'll be my first meeting, but just from observations from previous meetings, I didn't see a system up there where you can um, make sure that the, ne the next person who's ready to speak or in the queue um, is in the queue and they know they're supposed to speak. It's kind of like, like what we do here. You, you try to get the person's attention. So I don't know if you all have ever thought of that, but I, I don't think it's extremely expensive. Um, but there is a system you can get. It will require an additional little uh, laptop or iPad um, for the chair. And it shows him, you know, the person will push their button. So it just shows you who's next in the queue to speak so that, you know, you kind of can see who's trying to, to say something or whatever. Um, it also allows you to uh, cut the mics if they need to be cut, if people are being unruly or whatever. But I didn't know if you all had ever talked about that or discussed that. Um, I had been thinking about it, and since we will be going back, I just wanted to... You, mean, you, you, don't, you don't like my high-tech shuffling system that I've got <laughs> no, up here? No, <laughs> it's fine. You know, I'm usually <laughs> like, ah. but um, no, it's fine. But I just, I didn't know if you all had already had those conversations, but Ooh. it does kind of help with the movement of the meeting and, and identifying, making sure that persons are, you know, in the queue to speak so you can keep track of, you know, what's being said and so forth and so on. So anyway. Yeah, there, there are probably a couple meetings a year that where that would really come in handy, but normally we don't have as many. Uh, Commissioner Gerard, then we'll come to you. Yes, we have talked about that before. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't... I've always thought we needed one, but then the pandemic happened. Oh, okay. Um, and I still think we need one. Please, please, please don't get the one that PSTA uses because it's a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. And it takes a whole other person just to, just to work that. Sure the, and, the, and the print on that is so tiny, I was you can't just, even see. That's so up interesting that you said that because I was just going to hearken back to when we first moved our agenda electronically. And um, there was a lot of discussion about doing that. Della's shaking her head so she remembers because I knew from having been the chair at PSTA that this system we have, I legislate, has a lot more capacity in it. Barry's smiling. Uh, but, you know, and we decided not to include a lot of those ancillary things that you can do in I legislate just because we wanted everybody to get used to using the electronic version of the agenda. And, um, yeah, it was kind of fun. But anyway, so yep, maybe it's time to revisit the other opportunities they are in the program with I legislate and figure out maybe we can add a few of them or not, whatever the majority wishes to do. Oh. I like it. <laughs> no, I, I didn't have the pleasure. The it's so small, you have to have it right up in your face to be even see. And then somebody has to come in and make sure that they're sitting in the right seat. And 
no, it's some degree of paying yeah. attention. But there are much less technical ways to, uh, we had some 20 year old system at Largo that you just press the button and it should. Well, yeah, that, I mean, I mean nothing, a lot of cities just use the very simple one. I wasn't talking about the, you know, no, something no, as technical as that PSTA because yeah. it also has the voting mechanism in it and all of that. But anyway, just a thought a, because it can be very simple. Yeah, sitting way out on the end, I'm always like swimming. We can. The, I'm we'll, doing the. Way. We'll look at. We'll look into that and and bring that back to you. Um, I just, oh, go ahead. Oh, Commissioner, okay. there's, yeah. there's another issue that we haven't discussed. We've talked about. We said, are we going to continue with Zoom? Um, allowing yeah. people to participate from a Zoom meeting oh, or not. Yeah, hey, hold that thought. Just uh, Commissioner Justice had a comment on oh, the last no. thing real quick. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to say there is a function, and we, we tried it for a while. There is a request to speak. There is a motion. You can oh, make yeah. a motion on here. None of those did we ever really implement fully, and so we went back to, I mean, you'll see there's a voting button on items, and, and the votes appear on the back screen. But there is a request to speak, a motion, but we just never got really... We that, never really that used was, it that enough was to wear. Between us, really, uh, more so, it wasn't with the public, right? No, it was request to speak yeah, button here on the on the Granicus when he, an agenda item was. Yeah. But we had problems because when an agenda item was up, you couldn't go back and look at the attachments, and there was right. some, there was a lot of different those kind of things. But we never fully uh, bought into it. I guess is the easiest way to say. Um, so. But the, yeah, the system I'm talking about, only the chair has the actual iPad, if you will. And like I press my button here to speak. And so once I press my button to speak, it goes to the chair. He can see that I press my button and it puts you in order, but you don't, there's nothing else you can do other than press your buttons. But if the chairman doesn't notice that or get used to seeing that, he just calls the person that's raving their hand. Yeah. And so it would take some tra some training. Anyway, whichever just, way my head's I just brought it moment. up, so you know, for discussion, because sometimes it's just a little. But thank you. I, I just never did that. Well, I, I also assumed that part of your comments uh, were about the public. No, no it wasn't. Oh. None of they were. No, about, okay. None, okay. none of it was for public. Okay. Just for us when we're All trying right. to get your attention. All right. So to my, be able to speak. Okay. I thought that's what you, because my shuffling system was really about the people that have that, that have signed in to speak, and we have that, you know. No, because I think it's harder when you're sitting on the dais and trying to, when you're chairing on the dais and trying to see who's got their hand raised. Yeah. It's harder than this. But back to the Zoom question, can we go back? Let's go back to that. Go ahead, Barry. So, so we allow the public to participate in our meetings via Zoom mm -hmm. so they can sign up to speak. Um, and we put a, we said when we brought this issue up, we were gonna say, are we gonna go back to where it's in person or is the pledge of the board to continue to allow people to participate in, via Zoom at our meetings? Um, so that's a, it's really a, a policy question uh, for the commissioners. Um, yeah. To, we, Cause we have to advertise these. So, you know, we would, I'm, I'm talking about for the, for when we go back in August, not yeah. not now, no, but, but those are those are things that we'd have to include in our advertisements. But I but and I think that one thing that we did, and we gave a couple meetings to transition, was that they have to register the day before. Correct. And I think it's worked out beautifully, and I do think it gives access to people who may not be able to get in a car and come down here, whether whatever age they are, whatever problem they're having. Um, they still have a chance to access their government, and I and I haven't seen any problems with it at all, frankly. So I'd rather go ahead, Commissioner Gerard. Well, except that half of them aren't there when you call on them, it's and okay. then we're sitting here waiting for them yeah. and trying to. I, Whatever. I, it's been pretty minimal since we came back to mm -hmm. in person. Yeah. We maybe have two in a meeting that actually show up when they say they're gonna. Yeah, which I think. I mean, I don't know that it's that complicated for us to continue providing that service, and that may be something that Barry wants to address with us, and from a from a technical or, or you know, we can do it however the commission wants. I just okay. it's really I understand, you know, but it's not a big deal to have it, is what you're saying from a cost standpoint from a, or from, from a, a from a technical okay. standpoint. No. All right. Any other thoughts on that? We don't have to make that decision today, but I mean, is there any? feeling about whether to continue having that access? And I was just going to mimic what I'm sure I hear Kim Say. saying is that 
if we continue to allow the citizens to participate by Zoom, that has to be part of our legal notice on the public hearings. Okay. okay. So. I, I mean, so again, we, we advertise those things, you know, two, three, four, you know, weeks in okay. advance. So it just to, to be cognizant of the fact that, again, kind of like moving the meeting location, this is the type of decision that we need to make well enough in advance so that we know to keep including that information or to take it out of the public hearing notices. But it's no additional cost. It's just part of the advertising that we're doing normally. We add that language. Yes? C correct. Okay. Correct. Exactly. And as far as your notices are going out now, that language is being included. Yeah. So you will continue taking comments by Zoom so long as those public notices are, are published that way. I got you. Thank you. Any other thoughts on it? Well, um, I, we have do, a system. Do, 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 we we have want, a, do we want to get some, I mean, we can take this up on Tuesday or whatever, but at some point I, I need to know from the commission if you want to continue that or not. Um, I don't like it. Okay. Um, well, I think we probably are going to end up having to take a vote on it because I can already hear difference <laughs> of opinions. Commissioner Seal. I really see no harm in continuing to do it. It does provide access to those who may not be able to physically attend a meeting. Okay. That's one. All right. Um, let's check on the notification link, you know, things that we may have to re-notice for, for August meetings. Let's mm -hmm. check on that, and then we'll talk about it on Tuesday. Okay. We'll talk about this at the end of the meeting on Tuesday. Um, um, and hopefully, you know, get some direction here from the commission about using Zoom for access to our commission meetings um, going are we, forward. Are we talking about at our commission meetings? Yes. Are we also going to take Zoom comments during our workshop? Um, the the, the, the tradition, as far as I'm concerned, that we've tried to do here is not to take public comments at our workshops, right? Correct. There's rare exception that, that, that we, we would change that, but that's the, that's not what we're talking about. It's just we're talking about Zoom comments for our commission meetings. So, okay. So we'll, uh, I, I, you know, it's only a few more days. So we'll do. We'll that's make fine. this kind of give you that direction on Tuesday. Okay. Um, about that. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, we'll take a break for 20 minutes to. 35 minutes, depending on when the sheriff gets here. All right, meeting is temporarily, I guess, in recess. Thank you.
Looks like everybody is ready to go. So, Pete, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Sheriff, good to have you here this morning. Um, thank you for getting over here as quickly as you could. Um, we are saving the best and biggest budget for last. <laughs> <laughs> biggest, baddest, and best. Mm -hmm. So anyway, good to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, appreciate the accommodation. We had a press conference with the governor this morning. He signed uh, a bill uh, dedicating a portion of East Lake Road as the Deputy Michael Magley Highway and also uh, over in Hillsborough County, two places for the Tampa and the Hillsborough deputy that were uh, killed, you know, all, everybody within that short period of time. So I appreciate you all yep. working with us on that. There was kind of a last minute thing that yep. came up. So yeah. uh, Great thanks. news for that, but uh, glad you're here today. Um, so I'm going to talk about our FY22 uh, budget. Uh, just to briefly uh, recap, our submitted budget, is, as you all have seen, is approximately $340 million. Uh, our FY22 non-general fund revenue that's projected is about $36.4 million, which makes uh, our general fund request from you, from the county, about $303 million. Uh, just to break it down briefly, about $180 million of it is for law enforcement, $132 million for jail operations, and $28 million for uh, judicial operations. The current year budget, uh, the 21 budget, is $330 million, uh, making our uh, FY22 increase minus non-recurring expenses about $8.2 million. We received our budget target from OMB, and the submission is in line with the request uh, of the target. So we submitted a budget that meets the target. So what I'm going to address are items that we submitted on the request for funding list um, that are outside of the budget that we submitted. The first item, which is an item we deal with every year and have dealt with every year, and you'll see as I make my remarks on this, I think that the county administrator and I have um, a way that it will be something that we don't have to address outside the budget every year. So we had an agreed upon model uh, for the past several years that we developed after uh, the Great Recession, after the economic downturn, uh, and during that period of time we weren't buying cars at all. And as we began the recovery, it became a challenge as to how to uh, recover and fund the vehicles. Um, on average, uh, we replace about 175 cars a year, and the annual cost to replace those vehicles is about $6 million. The projected vehicle replacement cost for FY22 is in line with that. It's actually $5.9 million. So for the past several years, we have submitted to you all uh, a vehicle replacement request with a couple of options. One is to pay on a cash basis. The other is to uh, finance the vehicles. And the decision for the last many years now has been to finance the vehicles. Um, and that debt service is included in the budget, and that debt service is in our proposed FY22 budget in the amount of $5.9 million. So coincidentally, really, uh, the debt service amount of $5.9 million that's in the budget that met the goal is the same amount that it would be to buy the cars. Uh, because the cost of the cars is $5.9 million for FY22. The debt service amount, which is for previous year's debt, is $5.9 million. Our total debt outstanding, uh, again, this is from all these previous years uh, financing, the total outstanding debt is about $13 million. So after discussions with the county administrator, uh, the proposal is for the county to use uh, non-recurring funds to pay off that $13 million in outstanding debt, just get it off the books, eliminate it, and then we move in FY22 and moving forward to a pay-as-we-go model. Um, and if we do that, which would the county administrator and I talked about with some type of a accurate inflation amount that's going to take into account the prices, price increases every year, uh, it, it should stay right around in that $6 million mark, uh, which is what is in the recurring budget. So this will flatten it out. This will take us totally out of debt, and we'll go to paying cash for cars every year uh, as opposed to having to go through the financing. So that is the, uh, the proposal for that, and it will, again, set a new model uh, as we move forward. Uh, Sheriff, just real quickly, and Barry, when we come back in, in March, or excuse me, Jesus, in June, July, excuse me, um, 
for the the overall budget in terms of how we're using those uh, those reserves. I'm assuming this will be one of those uses of those reserves, and so we'll have to take into account all of this when we make that final budget decision. Well, that's that's correct. So what he's going to present to you today, these are things we've discussed. I'm still looking at them overall in terms of, okay. of that. But yes, the idea is that rather than continuing to do that is use one-time money for one-time cost, then his recurring budget has enough to cover that cost. This is an ongoing cost and, you know, needs to be a, a occur every year. So why, why continue to, you know, drag this out? Let's include it into the base budget and then um, you know, that, that becomes a recurring cost. Um, and so, but I'll show you as part of the budget, all of the areas of where we're using one-time money for one-time purposes. You'll be able to see all okay. of that with the budget. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Sheriff. And, 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 and prior to the economic downturn, we were primarily paying cash for cars. Um, and I mean, there was a little financing going on, it was primarily, but the, the financing model really came after uh, the economic downturn because there simply just wasn't money there to do it. So this will take us out of that. Okay. So, and Commissioner, if you want, as I break, as I go through these different categories uh, with the cars, I'm now going to uh, segue into the requests about helicopter inspections. Do you want me to take any questions as we go through the sections? Yeah, just to it, it, we'll just take a just lift your head up and see if there's anybody that's got a question as we go. As we go, yeah, yeah as we go. So if probably. anybody has any questions on the cars, uh, this will be a good time as I'm going to yeah. switch now to yeah. helicopters. Anybody? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, as I think you all know, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office is the only law enforcement aviation provider in the county. Uh, we have three A-Star helicopters. One is a 1991, it's a 30-year-old helicopter that is the oldest A-Star law enforcement helicopter that's in service in the country. Um, a 2006 15-year-old helicopter and a 2015 six-year-old helicopter. Now, all of these helicopters are required to have periodic inspections uh, and overhauls, and all of those are mandated by the FAA. So there's no option or discretion about that. And when they call them inspections, and we use that term, but they're really overhauls, they're not just inspections. It's where things are replaced, and that's why there's a significant cost, because it's just not looking at things and seeing if everything's okay. They're really uh, more along the line of an overhaul. And they're based upon the age uh, and hours of use. Some of the overhauls are more extensive and more expensive than others. And they occur every 150 hours of use, every 600 hours of use, every 750 hours of use. And then there's big ones at the 12 year mark, which is an A-frame overhaul and inspection and the 15 year for engine uh, overhaul. So two of the helicopters uh, that we have, which are the two newest ones, will have significant overhauls required in FY22, and that cost will be $737,000. So again, that is just an FAA-mandated cost, and to keep those uh, helicopters up and running, that is an ask for uh, the money to perform those overhauls and inspections. Um, another issue uh, along the lines of helicopters is that 1991 helicopter, uh, the one that's 30 years old, it has to be replaced. Uh, it's just antiquated uh, for law enforcement use, and we're spending a lot of money on routine maintenance for it. Um, the new helicopter uh, that we'll need will cost fully loaded, and I say fully loaded because it's not just the cost of the helicopter and the engine, but it's all the avionics and all the law enforcement equipment and surveillance equipment and all the cameras and the stuff that have to be in it. The total cost of that is 6.2 million. We don't need the funding for that today. Uh, it, we will need it in increments about half at the six month mark and the balance at the 12 month mark from the time we order it. Uh, if we talk to, we talk to ASTAR and if we order it today, it'll take about a year. Uh, it'll take them about six months to get it uh, built and then another six months to get it all upfitted. Um, and that's where they are uh, now. So I've been talking to the county administrator about it. Um, he's aware of the need and we're gonna discuss some options. One of the options is to finance it. Another option is to uh, find some non-recurring money and pay cash for it, or maybe a hybrid of both. So we're in the process of discussing it, but I wanna make sure you all are aware that that helicopter just has to be replaced. We had some discussions and you should know that 
uh, we were looking at all the options and trying to and do everything we can is that one of the options was, and it's off the table now because this helicopter is just uh, sucking up so much on maintenance because it is old and it's not efficient, is that one of the th things we thought about was to try and use this helicopter re to replace your helicopter that's used for mosquito control because you have a very old one and to try and use one that is old but not older to replace it to save that but isn't going to work and it's really just putting good money after bad. So we anticipate that when we trade in this 30-year-old one that we can probably get, and the best estimate we have is somewhere around five hundred dollars to $600,000. And of course, we'll look at the option of trading it into ASTAR, see what we can get from that, or to use a helicopter broker and see what we can sell it for in the uh, private market. Um, and wherever we get more, uh, we'll do. So that $6.2 million should be reduced by about five to $600,000, depending upon what we can get for it uh, when we trade it in. So that's the situation with the helicopters, the, the $737,000 uh, for the inspections and the, the new uh, one to replace the 30-year-old one. So yeah. uh, th any, any questions? And that was the 737 is for the two newer ones. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and commissioners, just so you know, for over the last several years, we've spent about $2.6 million um, on non-recurring helicopter inspections between 17 and 19. So this is something that we have tr traditionally provided, you know, because it's necessary. Any questions? Oh, Commissioner Seal. I, I guess my question is, um, is there really a need for three helicopters or can you get by with two? No, there's a, absolutely there's a need for three because w as they're going through inspections and they're down and we're running the, the, remember, we're the only law enforcement aviation in the county and nobody else has anything. And these helicopters are running uh, all the time. Um, and when one's down or you get two down uh, it, and they do go down for inspections, they go down for maintenance, they go down for other reasons. And at different times, you need them for different things. So uh, three, there is a need for three operationally. Is from a benchmark standpoint, and it's we're, it's pretty normal. I mean, for a county this size, I mean, we're not that big geographically, right. but I mean, from a population, so it's pretty normal. Like over in Broward, Dade, they have the same type of fleets that were probably more. Okay, than but what you we feel have. comfortable as as compared mm -hmm. to other counties with the that the three is necessary. I'm extremely comfortable, Commissioner. And there's times even where we have a situation where all three helicopters are down. We've had a situation where we've actually had to have Hillsborough and Tampa PD cover for us because we didn't have a helicopter that we could use. So, you know, that is a problem. And just from a variety of things that happen, that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And if we had two, we just wouldn't be able to cover it the way we're covering it. Because when one goes down for maintenance, when they go down for these maintenance and overhauls and these big ones, sometimes they're down for two or three months at a time. So it, it's a big process, and uh, when you're running them, and we're running 20 hours a day, we have helicopters in the air 20 hours a day uh, for a whole variety of, of purposes, and it's one of those things where when you need it, you need it. So I, I'm very comfortable with where we are. We're not over uh, on helicopters. Okay. Any other questions on the helicopters? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. So the next item I want to talk about is the Marine unit. Um, and the request is for $604,000 to add five positions to the Marine unit. So our current staffing uh, in the Marine unit is nine with seven deputies, one corporal, and one sergeant. Uh, the day shift for Marine unit deputies is from 10 o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night. And uh, that is three deputies and a corporal. Uh, the evening shift is from 1 o'clock to 11 o'clock, and there's two deputies assigned to that. We also have, as part of the Marine unit, we also have uh, deputies that cover the envi environmental lands, which is Burker Creek, Shell Key, all those environmental lands uh, within the county. And uh, within all of that staffing, there is no relief factor built into it. And there's no accounting for deputies being off for training, for vacation, and all the other reasons why people are, are not there. Um, it, which leaves us in a really short-staffed situation. Uh, and three days a week, there is no evening shift boat in the water at all, which means after 6 o'clock p.m. anywhere in Pinellas County, whether it's in the intercoastal waterway, whether it's in the Gulf of Mexico, whether it's in Tampa Bay, or whether it's in the two big freshwater lakes of Lake Tarpon or Lake Seminole, there is no marine coverage at all. 
Uh, in many days, uh, we have two or three boats to cover all of those areas, to cover all of the Gulf, all of the intercoastal waterway, all of Tampa Bay, and the lakes. Uh, so what that means is that the lakes, uh, so Lake Seminole, Lake Tarpon, are not routinely patrolled, and the east side coverage in Tampa Bay is probably sporadic at best and really non-existent. The Environmental Lands Unit has uh, one deputy on most days, two on some, and it depends if somebody's off, then they're down to one uh, and it becomes a real challenge. Because the Marine Unit covers 334 square miles of water and environmental lands covers 16,000 acres. Uh, another challenge with that staffing uh, and the inadequacy of it is officer safety because it makes backup on the water very limited and deputies are having to take enforcement action really by themselves. Uh, so when you've got a couple boats out there and they're covering everything from the Pasco County line and the Gulf and the Intercoastal all the way down to the Manatee County line, and if somebody has to go over to the east side on Tampa Bay, they're by themselves. Uh, and that leaves somebody on the west side and in the intercoastal as well. And again, we don't have anybody on the lakes. So against that backdrop, there are 52,000 registered uh, boats in Pinellas County. You know, we respond to over 6,000 marine calls a year. And those calls are up, uh, and up 50% uh, from 4,000 where they were uh, about seven years ago. And the calls were up 21% just between 2018 and 2019. Is that as we're looking at data and all the data that we're looking at for a variety of purposes these days, I'm pretty much excluding 2020 because 2020 is such an anomaly year because of COVID. So I'm not going to even you know use any metrics or data, but really comparing 2018 to 2019, and those calls were up 21%. In 2019, we had 109 water rescues and 46 boat crashes uh, in Pinellas County. So our, because of the limited number of boats we have and the vast amount of water, our average response time to a water rescue is nine minutes. Uh, and our average response time to a reckless boater call is about 12 minutes. And that does not include the time it takes to actually get a boat in the water. Uh, so if there's nobody there and you gotta call somebody out from home, that response time is from the time the boat actually gets in the water until the time that they, they get there. But a lot of it is having to be done because of the inadequate staffing having to be done on a, on a call out basis, um, especially uh, after six o'clock at night. In 2019, uh, I think Commissioner Eggers, you raised issues about this then, and uh, we talked about it, and we added two deputies in 2019. So that just took us to where we are now. Uh, so before 2019, it was even more of a critical situation. So with the addition of these uh, five deputies that we're asking for, we can ensure that we have a minimum of three boats covering the Gulf of Mexico, the intercoastal waterway, until at least seven o'clock, seven days a week. So there won't be any gaps in coverage and two boats seven days a week until at least 11 o'clock PM, which I think at a county this size uh, with the number of voters, the number of people that are out there, the number of water rescues and the number of complaints that we're getting about reckless boaters and the need to have a Marine presence is probably the, where we should be and a, really a bare minimum of where we should be and that we should have Marine unit deputies out there uh, patrolling those areas. We'll also have coverage uh, on the east side in Tampa Bay, which we don't have now at all on weekends, and we will be able to actually patrol Lake Tarpon and Lake Seminole. To give you an idea as to what else is available out there, uh, the St. Pete Police Department has two boats and three full-time officers in its Marine unit, but their coverage stops at five o'clock uh, and six o'clock during the summer. Clearwater and Treasure Island have part-time units and the Gulfport Police Department has uh, an on-call boat. Uh, the Florida uh, Wildlife Commission has four officers in the area, uh, but they patrol land areas in addition uh, to the waterways and that they're very limited on the waterways. Uh, FWC officers who are assigned here also cover areas outside of Pinellas County. So FWC resources are nominal uh, and really the majority of marine response and marine enforcement uh, rests with us. So um, you compare where we are and to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office as an example is they have 14 deputies in their marine <coughs> and they have coverage 24 seven. So what we're asking for is the ability to have coverage seven days a week uh, up until 11 o'clock at night and to be able to adequately cover the intercoastal waterway, the Gulf of Mexico, the freshwater lakes and Tampa Bay, which we can't do now. No. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Sheriff. Good to see you. Yeah. I, I didn't know if we had either through our 
team or through your efforts, if we had thought about, uh, uh, I mean, I'm kind of going back to the helicopter or, or capital on, on marine units, done about legislative requests for seeking funding from Tallahassee or Washington now that those, all those things have changed? It's all changed. I mean, yeah, I mean, trying to get that kind of funding, you know, for, for that is, you know, I mean, you know, as you know, or I think, you know, earmarks stopped in Washington. Uh, they're just now starting to bring some of those things back. Uh, but, you know, to try and get that kind of funding for staffing and personal services. Uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think the operational. I would think more the, the one-time hmm. oh. capital, yeah. either a, a, the helicopter or a boat or those kind of things. That's just, you know, it, it's, since we've got a lot of friends right now. Well, I don't, you know, and what I see, you know, with some of that, too, is what you're seeing is, is that, you know, I guess it's a philosophical thing. You know, that you, you see, didn't see so much of it this year, but last year the governor vetoed a lot of that stuff. Uh, because I think you know he viewed it as it's a local funding responsibility, um, it, you know. But these are, I would say, every one of these are needs, uh, somewhat critical in some some aspects, um, and you know, I, you know, trying to go through that process, as you know well, <laughs> um, can be a challenge. Uh, I, I don't know that we would benefit from that. Yeah. Um, just, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Seal. You mentioned <clears throat> that Hillsborough has 14. Yes. Um, does that include the city of Tampa? Do they um, have a Marine Patrol as well? They have something, and I'm not sure exactly what city of Tampa has. We just looked at the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office just to compare sheriff's office to sheriff's office. Uh, I know Tampa does have uh, something. I'm not sure what they have. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> hi. Um, just wondering, what the breakdown in responsibilities, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is between fire rescue units, Coast Guard, Sheriff's Office, PDs. How do you, how does that break down and who's responsible for what? Well, so they'll respond, of, you know, fire departments have some boats and they're, they're reactive. They'll respond to calls if there's some type of a right. water rescue or there's a medical event or something, you know, they'll respond out there, but they're not out, they're not out there patrolling. Uh, the Coast Guard will respond as well, and they'll help out with some of the water rescues. Uh, we also rely to some degree uh, on Eckerd College. Uh, they have a search and rescue program down there at Eckerd College, and we rely on them as well. Um, but you know, with all of that is, is that none of those entities have any um, enforcement authority or enforcement responsibility. Uh, they are pretty much all of those, Eckerd, Coast Guard, uh, et cetera, are really the fire departments are there for when somebody's it, uh, it's a water rescue type situation. That's pretty much what they're doing. Right. We were talking about a lot of rescues, so. Yeah, and, and it's true, and, and there is, um, but that's what we responded to, you know, on top of what they're doing. I just want a clarification on, on the marine unit itself. You say we currently have nine, and you want five more. Correct. Okay, so it'd be a total of 14. Correct. And that include one corporal, one sergeant. Yeah, yes, so be a total, yes, one, one, one sergeant, one corporal, and the rest would be deputies, and yes. And, and again, to give us that coverage on in Tampa Bay and the lakes and the ICW, and what, it, what the plan would be is, and for backup, we would have a deputy assigned, we would take, as an example, the, the golf and the ICW, we'd have a north boat, a middle boat, and a south boat. And that way, you got people out there, and it goes to the enforcement and the complaints as well. Um, and that's something that's totally on us because nobody else is doing that and having that presence out there. And, and from a water rescue standpoint, if we're out there, we can respond immediately. I mean, I hear these calls go out now on the radio where you got people like in Tampa Bay where there's a rescue that's needed. And literally, there are times where nobody has anything. Uh, Coast Guard can't get there. FWC doesn't have anybody. We're on the west side or we don't even have any boats in the water. Uh, the fire departments will try. But everything goes to a launch stamp from a launch perspective as opposed to having somebody there. You know, and I guess I'd suggest that if you're that person that's capsized out there and you're, you know, treading water is, is that it'd be nice to have somebody that's actually in the water that can come help you as opposed to waiting for somebody to have to get called out or right. respond. So you're not looking at any new boats, though? No, we have plenty as far as that's concerned. We have six patrol boats. Oh, um, okay. I've and, never heard three. Okay. Yeah, no, we have six patrol boats that are actually for patrol function. And so I'm not asking for anything as far as any new boats. It's really, really, we just need the people to drive them is what it is and just get, get them in the water and, and get them out there. Okay. 
So you do have some stationed on the east side, just don't have anybody. We do. We, so we have a total, a total of 14 vessels. Some of them are, and six of them are patrol boats, but some of them are very specialty boats. We have, like we have some flat bottom boats uh, for the areas. We have one that we keep down at Fort DeSoto. We have one on the east side. And some of them to get into some of those, and for the lakes, some of them are the uh, inflatables. So when I say 14 vessels, they're not all 14. They're, you know, air, and we have an air boat uh, to get into some of those areas if you need to. But the real patrol boats, they're six. And a couple of those we have been able to obtain through grants. Yeah, well, if you get out, if you get a chance to get out with the uh, the officers on out on the water, I mean, it is it is pretty. Uh, it's a, you know, if you only have the one officer out there responding to a situation, it is pretty nerve wracking. Um, and uh, just, I mean, I, I don't want to call it a lonely job, but when you're out there by yourself uh, on the open waters, whether it's a, a really a criminal activity or even just, you know, people being a little. They've probably had too much to drink or whatever. They're getting a little rowdy, and to just have one officer responding is just just doesn't do it justice um, in any in any ways. Um, so yeah, I, I think we needed to upgrade or up the number for sure. Any other questions for the sheriff on that one? Okay, go ahead. So the last thing to talk about uh, is the mental health unit and. Um, the ask is for uh, 1.3 million to fund our expanded mental health unit. So we know that after uh, the George, George Floyd murder last year, that there have been a lot of calls uh, for changes to how we police. And one of the top issues has been addressing people with mental health issues in a better way. Uh, I think we could all agree that mental health should not be criminalized and that jailing people who do minor bad acts uh, due to mental illness doesn't solve anything. In fact, it actually makes it worse and really exacerbates the problem. And that is something that we have long recognized uh, in the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. We've been, been, been making efforts to divert people uh, from the criminal justice system to the mental health system for years. So this isn't anything new for us. Um, but uh, that premise is easier said than done uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is, is that cops are unqualified uh, to diagnose or treat people with mental illness. And the mental health system uh, is underfunded and understaffed, especially in the area of master case management. So better addressing these people with mental health issues, co-occurring disorders, means having qualified mental health professionals, not cops, um, evaluate the people and participate in the decision-making process as to whether the person needs an involuntary exam uh, and how to get them best into services and keep them out of the jail, keep them out of the criminal justice system. Um, in 2016, recognizing all of that, uh, we started a mental health unit, uh, and we started it by assigning some deputies on a pilot basis, uh, along with some contracted mental health professionals. And the idea was to do what is today the flavor of the day. Uh, it wasn't back then, but it is now a co-response model, where you have a deputy responding with a mental health professional. And the premise is, is that if you have somebody there who is qualified, a mental health professional, along with the deputy uh, who is going to provide all the scene safety and deal with people who are acting violently, et cetera, uh, or may have committed a crime, um, that you're going to have a better outcome than you would if you just have a deputy responding. Because the way deputies solve those situations is the way cops solve a lot of situations. You remove the problem from the situation. You remove the problem from the scene. And that's either putting somebody in jail or Baker Act them. And so many times, that is not the right way. That is not the right solution. And it doesn't accomplish anything. And we're really setting up the cops uh, for a lack of success, because we're asking people who are the most called upon and the least qualified to do these assessments and make these decisions. Cops don't have mental health training. You get a couple hours in the police academy. If you're lucky, you went to crisis intervention team training, which is CIT training, which is 40 hours, which is good. But that doesn't make you a mental health professional. That doesn't make you the person that can do a differential diagnosis, that can figure out what's wrong, get the person in the right lane. And frankly, you can, as you're dealing with cops, you can, it's all about what you say. You can talk yourself into a Baker Act or you can talk yourself out of a Baker Act. And a lot of times it isn't even the right decision. And then when a person gets Baker Acted, is, is that they go to the receiving facility, they're evaluated. Remember, Baker Act is not treatment, it's an evaluation. And sometime within a couple of hours, up to a maximum of 72 hours, they're going to be released. 
And the next time they have a touch again is when they're back in crisis again, or somebody thinks they're back in crisis again, and here we go, we're right back on their hamster wheel, and we're really not getting any place. So we tried this pilot in 2016 as a co-response model, and quite honestly, we had a lot of lessons to learn. It was very eye-opening for us, and it really didn't work out. Um, and we had to transition it uh, from a co-response model into a follow-up model or a case management model. And we actually had good success with that because as the people were Baker acted, as there were contacts with law enforcement, as opposed to trying to respond at the time it was happening, is that we were following up because discharge planning was not good uh, if it existed at all. When people were getting out of the receiving facilities, getting out of care, uh, they were having contacts with the law enforcement. But nobody was following up, again, until they're back in crisis. The whole idea is to keep people out of crisis, to keep people out of the system, and to be proactive about it uh, and try and, and deal with the problems as opposed to just responding to them. So we had some success with that, and we saw that it was working. We had uh, a sergeant, a corporal, and a couple of deputies that we put in there, uh, and those positions uh, were funded. They, they've been in the budget since 2016. They're funded um, and we're going along. In 2018, we recognized that a whole lot of those people really needed more critical case management, not just the case management that the deputy and the mental health counselor could provide on the street by going to their homes and talking to caregivers, talking to family members, trying to get them into services and following up. So uh, the county, uh, Central, Central Florida Behavioral Health, the Sheriff's Office, we formed the Pinellas Integrated Care Alliance and uh, PICA, as it's called, uh, with uh, a contract through PEMS and some other providers, we now have uh, about eight counselors that are case managing somewhere around 80 people a month. And that is effective case management. It's working, it has worked since 2018. It is keeping people out of the criminal justice system and keeping people out of the mental health system as far as any inpatient treatment is concerned because they're getting the right services. So we know that we've having success with the mental health team that's on the street. We know we're having success with PICA. So what we were doing was addressing everything on the back end of the circle, but we still had a void and we still weren't addressing the front end through a co-response model. So last year, after uh, George Floyd and all the calls and things need to change, again, this is something that we had already known about and that we were already doing and they already tried. And we had the back end, but we didn't have the front end of the circle. So I said, let's try again uh, with all of the lessons we learned, all the experiences that we had, and let's try again to make the circle complete. Let's put people on the front end. And so we created a pilot area, uh, and the pilot area runs from State Road 580 uh, down to Bel Air Road everything to the west of US-19, excepting the city of Dunedin. So it's all the unincorporated area. And let's put deputies with mental health counselors and let's respond to the calls on the front end. So we put that in place and we also partnered, partnered with the city of Clearwater. And Clearwater and Chief Slaughter uh, wanted in on this and they are fully funding the personnel in the city of Clearwater. So I didn't have any funding for it. So what we did is, is, is to take uh, existing positions and temporarily reassign them uh, into the pilot area uh, just to see if we now had learned a lot of lessons and whether this would work. Um, I can tell you the pilot now has been fully up and running uh, for about three months and it's working very well. Um, and now we truly have, um, at least from our contribution, our perspective, a system of care, and that is we have a complete circle. So in the pilot area, if a call comes in, the call takers in the communication center and the 911 call takers have been trained in this, is to assess every call and determine whether what people are calling about, whether it's juvenile trouble, whether it's a domestic, whether it, whatever it is, is, is it doesn't involve somebody with mental health issues. And if it does, then the co-responder mental health team responds. So it's a deputy and a licensed health, and a mental health professional that will respond as opposed to the sector deputy. They go out and they assess the situation, they determine whether somebody's in need of services, whether somebody's appropriate for a Baker Act, but the whole goal is to do a better job of not Baker Acting people and to keep them in place, get them services, and then get over to case management. So we have six teams that are part of the co-response, and two teams that are doing follow-up. 
So if a call comes in today, and let's say it's domestic related, uh, they go out and determine that one of the people involved in it has mental health issues, they will make a determination, does somebody have to be arrested? If they don't, we don't arrest them. Do they absolutely have to be Baker Acted? If they don't, we won't Baker Act them. And we'll leave them in place and we'll get them follow-up services. The follow-up services can come from the follow-up teams that then we'll go back out later that day, the next day continually trying to get them into the, the right space and even uh, refer them under the right circumstances to PICA, which is the <coughs> Integrated Care Alliance and the PIC teams that will provide more long-term case management for these people. So I can tell you that the, the, the data shows that over the last three months that we have um, mitigated um, about 102 situations that otherwise would have resulted in Baker Acts. So it is working, uh, very confident that we have the right model, uh, very confident that it, that it is on the right track. To give you an idea as to the staffing, these teams, uh, they work uh, five days a week and it's staffed 16 hours a day, but it's only in the pilot area and it's only five days a week because it's a limited number of personnel that we have temporarily assigned uh, to this. Um, the ask is to make this permanent um, and to fund these positions uh, that we've added for the co-response model. So again, what we have uh, funded in the mental health unit right now are four positions, two deputies, one corporal, and one sergeant. And what we need to add to make this permanent is four deputies, the six mental health counselors, and one clinical supervisor because the mental health uh, counselors have to be supervised by a licensed person. So that would be uh, the 1.3 million to add those positions so we can make this permanent. I, I'm confident that we can expand the pilot area. Uh, I think the next place that we will probably move is in the unincorporated area down into High Point um, and into that area down towards Olmerton Road, uh, a little bit further probably to the west but we're gonna keep it into the unincorporated area um, with us uh, for now. Eventually, I think that the model that we have is going to be a viable model to go countywide. And, and I don't have a time frame for that. We just need to take it slow and uh, see if we can get this up and running on a permanent way. Um, but I know we're on the right track with it. So this model that we're using is a co-response model. Um, it's working well with us and the city of Clearwater. Uh, I know in talking to Chief Slaughter that they're seeing good results with what they're doing in the city of Clearwater as well. I think there's an opportunity here to expand it into other partnerships with other cities and gain economies of scale um, as we were able to expand it. The city of St. Pete is addressing mental health issues, but they're doing it in a different way. They don't have a co-responder model. They have uh, an independent response model, and those are the two options that are really uh, out there in the country today with law enforcement. It's either a co-response model or an independent response model. And they're trying that in St. Pete. Uh, so it's just a, a, a different way of getting to the same place. Uh, I, I personally don't feel comfortable with the independent response model, uh, given the types of calls and the nature of it, but that doesn't, that's not a comment that what St. Pete's doing is not okay, it's, it's fine. It's just, it, there's different philosophies and uh, just different ways of, of approaching it. So uh, the ask is uh, for that 1.3 million to fund these positions, to keep us on the same path that we're on, to move it forward. Um, I'm not asking for any money in the current fiscal year. We'll continue to just temporarily assign these people and we just literally took people from their existing positions and uh, moved them over there temporarily. But there's voids in these other places and they're short in these other places, but I think it's worth it to try this. But I can see from where we are that it, it, it's something that we really should be making permanent. Um, because as we all know the adage, you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you always got. If you want it differently and you want a different outcome, you got to do it differently. And I think we've learned a lot over the last five years now since we started this in 2016. I think we got the right people with the right model and we're getting better outcomes. Commissioner Long, I had a question. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you for that very articulate way of expressing the need, Sheriff. And I would like to uh, take this opportunity to publicly thank you for your partnership and your assistance in helping us get the Moroni Foundation off the ground because its total focus has been for this past year to provide those same services you're talking about with regard to mental health 
to our law enforcement and first responder community. That said, with the um, awareness that the George Floyd incident has brought to the law enforcement community and the ancillary problems surrounding that that have happened throughout the United States, I'm very uh, worried about and concerned about what that has done to the morale and the um, overall retention rate with your deputies and your law enforcement folks. And if you are seeing, uh, what is it like internally with your folks and, and how they're dealing with these stories that everyone seems to be so up in arms about? Yes, yeah, so un unfortunately, we are seeing some uh, effect of it. In fact, uh, last week, uh, we lost three deputies that just decided to get out of law enforcement altogether. Uh, there is an uptick in people leaving. Uh, we are seeing greater attrition rates than what we had seen in the past, and they're not going to other agencies. They're totally getting out of law enforcement. So we are starting to see that. Um, we normally attrit uh, about four law enforcement deputies a month. In, in recent months, we've seen eight or ten. So. Um, it is a concern, um, and it's just something we're going to have to uh, continue to address, and hopefully by doing some of the things that we are to give them confidence that the community does support law enforcement. Uh, I think that overall there's good community support in Pinellas County for law enforcement, um, and that it, it is a worthwhile uh, career to stay in. But when I see people that are getting out and some of the, them that have left, uh, you know, one's going in this past week, going into the food service business. Another went into the pest control business. Another went and opened a, a, a animal kennel business. So people are getting out. They just they, they look at it, they weigh it, and say, not worth it. So, uh, but we you know, need to keep an eye on that uh, for sure. Uh, we're okay right now, uh, but it, it's also a challenge to hire. Uh, and it's not a, it's not a question of getting applicants. Plenty of applicants. But it's good quality applicants uh, is what the, the challenge is. So it, it is an issue we're dealing with. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I guess um, this all kind of gives me a headache. You're <laughs> I love what you're doing and that you're that you've been willing and your department's been willing to step up to the plate. I really hate to hear you talking about case management because I've been hearing for years law enforcement has no business being in the mental health business but we're getting farther and farther into it mm -hmm. and I guess I my first question is how does this how does it mesh with what we're trying to do on the front end the whole uh, centralized intake thing and have you know do you really want to go down that rabbit hole because it's huge well, I think we have to right now. Uh, Barry and I have had a lot of discussions about this, and of course I'm aware of what's going on with KPMG and trying to get us here in Pinellas County into a true system of care. I can tell you that uh, Barry and I are very uh, philosophically aligned. Uh, we see this the same way. We talk about it a lot. Um, and I think that, the, that what we're doing here, um, and, and, and importantly, we've had this discussion. We don't want to and shouldn't invest too much in this. We shouldn't bite off more because we need to get the economies of scale. We need to make sure it's a, a system of care, and we need to look for ways that if these people who are doing this function are reducing workloads in other places, then we need to take that into account. But I can tell you that with what I'm asking for here, this is such bare bones that it, it is that no matter what we do, and that's why I'm not coming to you asking for more than this, because I think we need to see what happens with KPMG, see what happens with a true system of care. We need to see if we ever get to a true receiving, uh, uh, re, you know, receiving facility concept where it's one-stop shopping, where the cop doesn't need to know what the person's problem is, other than there is a problem, get them there and then let a, a professional figure it out and let somebody else. I've said this for a long time, Commissioner, and you've heard me say it and we've talked about this, is that I'm more than willing <laughs> for somebody else to come in and take this on, but there's nobody standing at the door. So the problem is still ours. And if we don't do it differently in this period of time uh, as we're going down this path, which it takes time, <clears throat> then we're just going to go back to Baker acting the heck out of people and putting people in jail, criminalizing mental health. And we don't want to do that. It's just not right. So I think this is really 
a, a very uh, limited investment, a necessary investment that will uh, suit us well in the long term, but it, it is not overly aggressive and it's not too much at this juncture because I'm very aware and I know the administrator is very aware that all of this has to come together and it's got to be integrated and it needs to be part of a master plan. Yeah, and, and I think the sheriff's data and his, and his experience in this is going to be critical as we design the KPMG process. Um, having that, you know, integrated face to where, because again, you know, even, even his mental health person that responds out on scene, having them to be able to hook up into an appointment, schedule, get assistance right there real time is going to be, is going to be key. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to, use that and we're going to integrate them as part of this process um, and learn from that and, and we, we want the data to talk about the difference in a, it's a different type of call so they're they're you know uh, an officer's clearing a case and they're moving on to the next one you with you respond to this type of call you're going to spend more time so it's not a one-to-one -one, but certainly there's a drawdown in the overall amount of resources within a particular area we want to see that data to see how we can also do this efficiently um, and what that offset is on that, but we'll need time and um, some data to figure that out. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Chair, for your um, very thorough presentation, and thank you for um, being um, present in a number of community conversations, Zooms. We were on a couple together um, to hear from the community um, and to move forward. Um, with trying to come to a medium about how we handle calls, how we handle mental health issues and things of that nature overall. So thank you for that. I just wanna make sure I'm putting in my notes the correct information. Initially, you were talking about the co-response program back in 2016 when it started. You moved to more of a case manager model. Um, and then when you were wrapping up, you said we're moving forward with the co-response. I just wanna make sure that that's the program that you're that we're moving forward with yeah or that's so, the title yeah so it's a right now I would say it is comprehensive it, it is a uh, co-response model that is um, supported with follow-up teams that is supported with case management through PICA and so I think we have really uh, the most comprehensive model possible and at this juncture and where all of this should go, though, is to integrate with an overall system of care where it is integrated with the private pr providers, the community-based providers, and perhaps ultimately some type of a receiving facility. Um, so, but in the interim, we've got it comprehensive and we've got the circle complete. If we were to end this, we would go back to having nothing other than case management with two deputies, a corporal and a sergeant, that's it. We wouldn't have people out there responding to these calls. So the 102 people over the last three months that we have not Baker acted because somebody was there to make a better decision, who was qualified to make the decision and said, no, deputy, you don't need to Baker act this person. This person can stay here. We can get them services and put them with the follow-up teams. Those 102 people would be Baker acted. Mm -hmm. so, I think it's uh, on the right path, on the right track. It's comprehensive, but it's also the tip. And it's a good start to hopefully where we're going as a result of what comes out of the KPMG uh, recommendations. And you said four deputies, six mental health clinicians, and I, I missed the last one. So you're right. So it's four deputies, um, and it's a total of make sure I get make sure I got this right. So you have it in six, and uh, one of them is a clinical supervisor. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure that yeah, it's six mental health um, response specialist, one mental health clinical supervisor, right. and four assisting patrol deputies. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And the four, the four, six, and one. Okay. I was missing that last, the one yeah, per yeah. position. The um, city of St. Pete using the community assistance liaison piece where they've contracted with Gulf Coast to be the lead agency on that, and then Gulf Coast has contracted with other right. mental health um, organizations so that an officer on the scene then makes that call, someone comes out, um, and 
makes the assessment of kind of what's going on and and that there are deliverable services to the person to prevent them from being Baker Acted because all of that will bring about an additional funding issue for the places of where, which is Windermere um, or PIMS for younger people where you can um, Baker Act them. So I think we're moving in the right direction when it comes to what it is that we want to do. Uh, Commissioner Gerard, I agree with you when you say, and I think the sheriff thinks the same thing, that police officers, they are not licensed mental health clinicians or clinical social workers. That's not their vitae or their area. And it does take officers off the street from doing whatever they will be doing in their realm. Um, but I do know it's going to take some time to find that sweet spot where there is the right type of response and timely response for persons who are decomping. Um, and how that you know we can work some things out so that they are not arrested, placed in jail, only to be released um, or further detained, which then causes a whole lot of other issues. So I think we're headed in the right direction there. Um, I would love to, you know, I know we have additional um, meetings to talk about the budget and what we approve or don't approve. Um, but as a part of this, um, I would love to. Uh, have at some point some kind of report on numbers, you know, where we are for the number of people we've encountered, the number of repeats that have come back in, because I know that's one thing um, individuals look for in those calls, you know, is this a repeat person? Um, and, uh, you know, maybe some success stories out of it, you know, who we've been able to transition, maybe find family for them in another state that allows them to go and be with them and, you know, things of that nature. Um, the only other um, thing, I, I understood what you said about the helicopters, one being down, needing to replace. I know the question was asked because we're all looking at how we can save some money or whatever. So I know that's why that question was asked. But um, the only other thing I want to say is um, it depends on who you talk to when they are using the definition of, and I'm going to say this bad word, defund the police. That is not something I've ever supported. Chief, the sheriff has heard me say that. Um, but it's looking for alternatives for things that the police shouldn't really be doing. And so I really appreciate the support in that, in that realm. And I think retention in a number of areas um, for certain jobs um, are finding it difficult to hire in some of those um, positions. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sad that for any officer who decided to become a police officer and then decide that they no longer want to be because of certain circumstances, viewpoints, um, that that's not their dream anymore, you know, um, because we could always use good people out there uh, to handle people who are doing things that are wrong and sometimes persons who need that help, that, that support um, that's there for them. So. Those were the questions that I had, just trying to get my head wrapped around the direction and focus that we're going um, and um, how we'll, you know, look at moving forward, moving from a more deputy-oriented thing to maybe deputy first responder, but support and, and boots on the ground really coming from that clinical um, component piece. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Seal. I'll get back to you. Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I truly want to thank you and all of your personnel because you do keep Pinellas safe. And it's, um, your leadership statewide is well recognized. And um, we thank you for everything that you do. In our background narrative, <clears throat> it does, though, mention that staffing levels have increased by 68 positions with 50 positions in law enforcement since 2018. Is that correct? Well, well, and some of those are increased in contract city positions where the cities have increased with community policing deputies, traffic positions, et cetera. Some of those are um, a, a reclassification of some part-time positions. So it, 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 yes, the math is correct, but it's not what it looks like as far as, you know, it is the, we've had this big massive increase in the number of positions. There have been some. And some have moved around too, like in, from different areas uh, due to reorganization. So it depends upon what you're looking at in there. So as an example, uh, we took, um, there were 10 positions in judicial <coughs> operations that moved over to law enforcement. That's a move um, in uh, positions from one area to another area. 
So I think you really got to you really got to peel that back and look at it uh, to figure out you know what it all means. But it isn't that we've had this big growth in the number of, of people uh, you know out there. And, and again, a lot of it has to do with the contract cities too. Okay. Um, I know that having attended um, talking about the mental health initiative, and I tend to echo Commissioner Gerard, um, but I you're filling the vacuum at this point. And hopefully, as we finish designing the system, we figure out how the synergies are all going to work together. Um, are you also um, encountering or working with the homeless leadership board? I mean, are you encountering a lot of homeless people that you're sure. helping to address? And then are you diverting people from the jail as well so that we could see some savings someplace? I'm just kind of curious. You know, this last year, as we know, has been different. But, you know, and, I know. And the reason why I'm laughing is, is because, you know, we talked about this, and Commissioner Gerard, you know, in, um, you know, do you all know how long Safe Harbor's been open now? 11 years. And I'm still waiting from what I said 11 years ago. To I won't get it. in that homeless business. Show me someplace else in the country, and I challenge anybody, show me someplace else in the country where the sheriff of the county is the largest provider of homeless services in that county. I'd get out of the business tomorrow. Should I be in that business? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Somebody else come do it, but nobody's stepping up. So it's a choice of step up and do it, or we go back to putting people in jail, we go back to 600 on the floor, we go back to criminalizing homelessness and all those other things. Mm -hmm. So pretty much I would say, Commissioner, as far as Safe Harbor's concerned, as far as homeless is concerned, et cetera, I think unfortunately right now, uh, and we have been for a while, I, I think we're in a plateau. Uh, some would say stagnant. And, and the, the only way that you're gonna get any better with that is again, through services, through case management, through counseling, through, we're diverting all the people that we can um, and getting as many people into Safe Harbor and then getting them into transitional housing and moving them down to Pinellas Hope or to other places and, and moving them through there. But I would say that it's stagnant. I, you know, and it goes back to, you gotta do it differently to get a different outcome. I, I, I know that we made an exponential difference and we changed it because I saw a huge decline in the jail population. I don't know if you recall, you were oh, here. Was, we had about uh, 3,600 people in the jail back in 2010. We had 600 on the floor. It was a mess. And it was a log jam. And so we opened Safe Harbor. The jail population pretty much immediately went down to 3,200. We got the people off the floor. We're getting them services. We had a lot more services back then. The services at Safe Harbor have declined over the last several years because people who are providing those services pulled out. And why they pull out? Funding, of course. That's what drives everything. So I don't, you know, again, maybe as we uh, explore uh, what's going to come out of the KP, KP, KPMG recommendations, we look at uh, a, a true uh, system of care. We're trying to integrate, trying to break down the silos, break down all of the, the barriers to, to making a difference. I think all of it has to be looked at and all of it's on the table. But, you know, in the meantime, it's either we do it or it doesn't get done. And same thing with, uh, with, with uh, case management. Should we have, you can have that, we, we can have a great discussion about it. Should we have deputy sheriffs teamed with counselors who are going out there knocking on doors and case managing people uh, about services or should when somebody at PEMS on the Pinellas Integrated Care Alliance, one of those case managers, cannot get in touch with somebody because they need to go to an appointment, et cetera, should a deputy sheriff be the one that's being called to go out there and find these people and get them to, so they go to a doctor's point? We can have that, but the reality is if we're not doing it, nobody's doing it. So, you know, I think those are valid points. Uh, they really are. And maybe we're at a juncture now with, with KPMG and where we are and the alignment philosophically, et cetera. I'm optimistic that we can figure out a way to actually make some really dynamic and uh, systematic changes here in Pinellas County and that we don't just do what we've done, which is temporary fixes, band-aids. Yeah. And so I, I, I hear you, you're right. But if we don't do it, who's doing it? And say, like in St. Pete, and Commissioner Flowers knows, and her district down there, is that what, what did Central Ave look like? What did downtown St. Pete look like before we opened Safe Harbor? <laughs> it wasn't good. Um, and, you know, and so... Um, 
Yeah. And I don't disagree. I said, you know, yeah. you're you're yeah. you're coming into the vacuum. Right. And right. so. No, I, I know, I, I know, and I appreciate yeah. the comments. And like I said, we can have some really good, you know, dialogue about it. And, and, and it's an absolutely legitimate question is, should we be doing it? Mm -hmm. And the answer to it is probably no. But until somebody else, until the, until the void is filled, here we are. Yeah. Um, the, other, the only other question I had was, um, I know you mentioned that um, law enforcement gets very little mental health training. I remember NAMI, I believe, was doing, um, trying to get into more education for the officers. Are they still do, yeah, playing so, you know, that it, role? Yeah, uh, CIT, which is with NAMI, uh, yeah. the Crisis Intervention Team Training. And we were able to, and I was able to talk to them because again, it goes also to attrition. <laughs> so the problem is, is that you, you don't get it in the police academy, you don't get it in basic training, you send the officers and the deputies to CIT training. So we were at a point, you know, years ago where we had a lot of deputies that were CIT trained. Um, but as they leave uh, and we have attrition, then you got, we we're, I think last year when we looked at it, now we're doing more and more classes. I got with them and told them we need to uh, be more robust with this. We need to offer more classes. Of our patrol deputies, of we only had like 23% that were CIT trained. Um, and it, it was a challenge because they were only doing like one class a year. And so at one class a year, and we only had like, I don't know, 10 seats in the class. St. Pete got seats, we got seats, Clearwater got seats, other ones. And when you're only doing one or two, you can never catch up. So I talked to them and said, we got to do something differently. So we're now doing, and we just started it here uh, a couple months ago, we're now doing uh, one class a month with 30 people in a class. But that 30 people is for us, St. Pete, Clearwater, Largo, everybody else. And we're not the only ones. I know I've talked to Chief Holloway about it. Uh, he, he's in the same boat where they have, through attrition, they don't have enough people that are CI. So he's getting a lot of people in as well. Clearwater, from talking to Chief Slaughter, they're in good shape, uh, or in better shape than we are. Uh, but uh, we are way under trained. But with working with the providers of the CIT training, we're now getting the classes and we'll try and play catch up, but it's probably gonna take probably a year or two to get us back where we were before. Yeah. And just one final comment, I already said thank you, but I wanna also emphasize how much we appreciated everything that you and your teams did during COVID. I mean, we could not have made it through everything that we encountered without all of your leadership and, and everyone else's help. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I know that uh, our personnel will appreciate the comments and thoughts. It was truly a team effort, and you know that's not a cliche. It really was. Is, is that the level of cooperation, collaboration, teamwork uh, by so many people here in Pinellas County was a model about how government should work. Yeah, thank you for that last comment. I had that on my notes to say, so we don't. I don't need to do that. But it's. It really has been unbelievable to work. Uh, Barry's group, your group, all the different groups. Uh, Dr. Cho's group, trying to pull this thing together this past year. Unbelievable. Um, and thank you for your leadership on that. And you know, thank you for being there for uh, an enforcement arm during this past year, but also not taking it to the point of of making it more debilitating for these businesses than they're already experiencing. So we, we put it out there, educational, we talked to a lot of people, we tried to get people on board, but we didn't go overboard at all with the penalizing businesses that were already suffering. So you guys did a great job and, you know, appreciate that as well. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, Sheriff, that the numbers that I see on page 104 that talk about um, 2421 this year, 2421 in the in the budget request. Does that include the asks, or would that be additional? Which, which uh, page one of four, where you talk about the staffing summaries? Yeah, no, the decision packages are outside of. Uh, okay, so that would be numbers. additional. So those 16 additional positions takes it to 24, right? 37 or whatever. Um, is that right? Yeah. Correct. Yes, they're not. They're the the the, the new positions are. Not what's in the submitted okay. budget. If that's, I got you. Yeah. yeah. I got you. So it's the new positions are the marine unit positions and the mental health unit. That's yeah. correct. Yep. And that'll so when I summarize that, that'll be in my budget recommendation when when we okay figure out exactly you know what we're recommending. So when it's on target for with OMB's numbers, is that 
No, no, no. His budget, so he receives a target for right. the sheriff's office. They have submitted a budget within that target, and then these are requests uh, from oh. the sheriff's office for in addition to that target. Okay. All right. And so I, I'm going to look at all the decision packages and make one budget submittal and recommendation at that time. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any, yes, Commissioner Long? I'm not going to keep us, but I just wanted to say thank you as well, Sheriff, for the deputies that you provided us during the meetings that we've been having over this past year. It's been an extraordinary um, mission for them, and I'm grateful. So thank you. Anybody else for the Sheriff? Not for the Sheriff, but Okay. All right. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Appreciate yep. it. Thanks. Thank you. And the sheriff will be here next Tuesday also. So. Okay. Got it. Yes, Commissioner Seal. Um, on another note, um, I was just chatting with Lourdes about some other stuff, and I asked the question. Um, a few years ago, we put in a cost of living increase um, for the not-for-profits that we have contracts with, not where we give them grants, but where we have actual contracts. And I'd like us to look at that again. I mean, we put a COLA in our own budget mm -hmm. for our county, but I don't know how we can not look at when we're contracting with not-for-profits and realize that they have cost of living increases as well. So I'd like to take a look at that as part of this budget. As part of this budget? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's something new. Um, so I'll have to look at that. I don't know what the cost impact of that is. Well, I think um, I think it's unfair for us to ask the not-for-profits to continue to figure out how they do their own cost of living increases as well. I, I understand, I'm, but I'm, I've got to put together a budget in about a week and a half before to start yeah. publishing for the 13th. It's really a timing issue. I, I just, I'll ask the question. I just don't know. Um, but and I'm, I'm not arguing against it at all, but we took away targets for all of the Board of Commissioner departments, so we don't give them an automatic cost of living um, adjustment. They have, to, they have to justify anything now. Um, we only have that for the constitutional officers. Well, if it's not for this year, then I think it's something that we do need to be looking at. Okay, I'll talk to Lourdes afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, I like the, I like the approach of not giving a target to, to our folks to yeah. let them think I mean, without those kind of we've, artificial. We've items. looked at we we've looked hard and and you know we got kind of a little bit away from that this year with just you know COVID and everything. But you know last year we cut you know we cut our spending we reduced down reduced positions, um, and and I really want to see departments have a continuous improvement process. That's the whole reason we have Aubrey's group and looking at performance to where they drive efficiencies. Uh, to cover the cost, uh, you know, cost increases, to cover, you know, salary increases, they should be able to drive efficiencies each and every year. Now, that's not always possible, you know, but that's the goal. Um, and so we're going to continue to work with them to try to do that. Um, but point noted, Commissioner, I'll, and we'll look at it. Okay. Anything else? All right. So we'll be uh, back here at 1230 on Tuesday for our shade meeting uh, say, say it again oh thank you yeah 12 o'clock if you want pizza um, and then we'll we'll is that when it's going to get here yeah, okay so you have a half hour to get a bite to eat and then we'll have the hour, hour at, that's what we're kind of targeting an hour for that meeting and then we'll have another half hour before the actual meeting starts so yes say that again for Okay, so sometime between 11:30 and 12, the goods will arrive for for eating. All right. Anything else before we uh, adjourn? Okay. Seeing none, we are adjourned.